looks quality. brilliant. Is that an artist rendering or a real vehicle? It's a render, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we do have... It, um, it just looks a little bit too neat. <laughs> right. Yeah, there's no duct tape on them yet. <laughs> it's a good yeah. one. I do love what Krauss is doing. It's really, uh, you know, absolutely brilliant. And it's it's it must be such a satisfying uh, extension to all the work you've been doing on the gliding over the years. Yeah, it's nice, actually. It's... um. Yeah, as you say, it's almost a direct uh, sort of continuation. Um, the main kind of uh, difference is now I'm doing a lot more of the the kind of design and optimization work on the on the aircraft themselves, as well as the the software. But um, no, it's great to be involved in a, a bigger team that's doing it because obviously we've got um, a number of other very talented people on the team as well, including including Tom. Um, so we're able to accomplish uh, quite a bit. Yep, I've just got to go and put this live stream link on a bunch of places. So just give me a second while I go and announce it on on Facebook and LinkedIn. Sure. So maybe while you do that, I'll just test my uh, screen share. Uh, yes, I'll need to enable that for you. Great. Um, all right, hang on a second. And let me, okay, you should now have screen share capability. All right, now I've got to go and stick it on, on LinkedIn. So can you see my my slides on the screen share right now? I can. Got soaring update. Yep. And you don't see the uh, presenter notes on top of it? I do see the presenter notes on top of that. Ah, okay. Well, I think you I'll... don't intend that. We do. No, it, I'll just... Sam, we do in Zoom, but the, the live stream to YouTube doesn't see your presenter notes. Oh, oh interesting. interesting. Okay. I think, I think I'll just go without the speaker notes. <laughs> Now, I've got to go and get that link. So, Trudy, do you post, which of the socials are you posting to? So I've posted to Facebook and I've posted to uh, LinkedIn under my personal account. Be good to be shared as IG Pilot. I need, I need to work out how to use the LinkedIn IG Pilot thing. Um, if you could do Twitter, if you could, James, and uh, and maybe on Discuss as well. Yep. Um, thanks. Um, thanks very much. Oh, we got Ian here too. Ian, have you worked with Samuel before? Oh, really you're kind of at the moment. Slightly indirectly, but uh, but yeah. Fantastic. Ian's local here in Canberra, and uh, he's going to be popping out to our flying field to uh, to fly some gliders, which I'm looking forward to. That's awesome. Yeah, um, that'd be really great actually to get Ian's input. Well, to get some glider activity in Canberra, we've got a couple of members of Canberra UAV who've got some little gliders, uh, but um, nothing like the sort of, you know, uh, stuff, the soaring stuff that, uh, that you and Ian are doing. Yeah. Oh, you're muted, by the way, Ian. Uh, now that very intent look you get when somebody's trying to work out how to unmute. 
<laughs> it's just not yeah. obvious in Zoom for some reason. <laughs> yeah. You do recall that we do actually have a large glider floating around somewhere. Okay. Oh, we did. Yes. Uh, one of the one of the vendors sent us a nice glider, didn't they? Did Greg end up playing with that? I think. I'm not sure. I don't think we ever actually flew it. No, we didn't. We've got an embarrassing of history of vendors sending us aircraft. I shouldn't be saying this on a live tube where other vendors might see it. You know, they might uh, be less likely to send us an aircraft, sending us an aircraft and taking us an embarrassingly long time to actually get it built up and flowing. Um, so, because uh, we always have a, a lot of things going on uh, within the group. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'd like a big one. <laughs> it's very really expensive. So, um... Now, is 400 foot enough for you, Ian? I'm not talking about the wingspan. I'm talking about the uh, the height limit. Oh, sorry? The... 400 foot height limit. Um, or do uh, you have like well, a red lock and things? So far, that's, you know, for the research we did, that's all we had. Mostly. Right, okay. Because we could get permission for higher altitudes at Spring Valley. Right. Um, well, and Mitch Bannock has said that he thinks he could get that fairly easily, but yeah. we'd have to have, oh, apply for it, obviously, and, you know, get yeah. an exemption and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, well, it be might be worth gonna, trying. If you're going to be doing, if you're going to be doing gliding stuff, I really recommend it. It makes a really huge difference. Yeah, yeah. if we can get a couple of thousand feet, you know, that would probably make a very big difference. Um, so uh, it might be worth pinging Mitch and, and getting you to have a chat with him. Uh, yeah. We'd get it as, are you an MAAA member, Ian, by any chance? No, no, I need to sort all that stuff out. It might be worth <laughs> becoming an MAAA member um, and because uh, that would almost certainly be done under the MAAA, the permission for the higher altitudes, if we yeah. if we get that. that. That's how it was in the US when we were flying. You could get, I think, 2,000 feet straight out off of that. So, yeah. What gliders are you flying, Ian? Well, I, I haven't flown anything here yet. I said, well, I flew... Uh, I flew last weekend and broke my glider, the, the little one on, oh. the, on the left. Um, so I need to get out to Spring Valley with this, with this radium and, and give that a go. But I haven't, I haven't done anything for a couple of years, so um, I'm just getting back into it. Oh, welcome back. Now, I'll just make a few people co-host um, <laughs> in case there's any, any issues with the link. Um, so congratulations, Pete, you're going to be a co-host and Peter, I think you'd be a great co-host. That just means if, you know, my internet goes down, then somebody else, the, the call doesn't end. It keeps going. Um, responsibility. That's right. All right. Your gliders, um, they're power gliders, I presume, Ian. So just hand yeah. launch is easy. You don't need a, a bungee or anything. Tow plane. Shame in a way. It's quite fun doing the other launch methods. Yeah, yeah. No, well, we did that at Microsoft. Yeah. That was, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I knew a lot of people, I guess. And yeah. 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 We've done some bungee launches out at CMAC. Uh, I don't think we've tried a bungee launch at Spring Valley yet, but it would actually work quite well because of the slope on the paddock. You'd actually gain a bit of height. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if there's much advantage in it, really. Um, we said and done, given how small and efficient motors are now. Um, mm -hmm. I just the battery, uh, you know, less battery needed, I guess. Yeah. But, you know, that's also ballast, which can be quite handy sometimes mm -hmm. when it's windy. So I don't know. Um, when you get to the, uh, the bigger, heavier gliders, you have less choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, when you start, I mean, you've been doing some big flights, right, in, in the US. And I mean, you know, a small glider and a, and a big thermal, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's just a whole different game, really. Yeah. You know, you can have a lot of trouble getting them down.
Hey, Tridge, could you give me um, uh, recording access? Yes, sure. I'll just do that now. All right, you should have recording access there now, Randy. So it's coming up to the hour. I think I might uh, start the recording here. All right, so we are now recording. So um, welcome everyone to the second session of the 2021 Developer Conference. I hope you've had a, a nice break since our uh, fantastic session this morning. And um, in case you haven't noticed, the videos of this morning's session are now up as a playlist on the ardupilot.org YouTube channel. So if you were asleep this morning and uh, missed any of the talks, then you can go and watch them. Uh, there's a video of the entire session or there's four separate videos of the four talks. Uh, so you can uh, you know, do it whichever way you prefer. So um, this evening, uh, we have the pleasure of a talk from Samuel Tabor, who's coming all the way from Scotland and uh, giving us a talk about uh, IG Pilot soaring. And there's been many exciting things happening in soaring. So uh, looking forward to it. Over to you, Samuel. Great stuff. Thanks, Andrew. And, uh, and hi, everyone. Um, so yes, there's a bit of an update about the, the soaring feature, um, of which um, I'm the, the maintainer currently. Um, so a bit of a roadmap um, to this talk. So although the title is um, Soaring Update, I realize I haven't actually given a, a talk about uh, this feature in the past. Um, so to kick it off, there's a bit of an introduction, what it is, um, why would you want to do it, and a bit of the background about uh, what thermal soaring is all about and uh, how we can make use of it um, with, uh, with UAVs. Um, then there's a bit of a description about the current implementation um, in the code and some recent progress towards um, improving um, the existing features. Um, and then the, the later part of the talk is around uh, some of the new developments um, which are currently being, um, being tested and, and evaluated. Um, and then finally, some, uh, some future um, ideas as well. So, um, so what is it? So it's a set of features to um, enable gliders to stay aloft for long periods of time without using um, batteries uh, or other propulsion, um, or to do it uh, automatically, ideally. Um, and it's implemented as a, as a library, AP soaring, um, and as a, as a flight mode, thermal flight mode. And the history of this technology goes back um, quite a long way before um, RG Pilot um, got involved um, with it. So, it's been under research for quite a long period of time. This is about the, the, the mid 2000s um, by various research groups, including um, NASA and NRL. Um, and um, I got interested in about 2013 and um, developed some of the, the features as a fork, um, which I um, had some fun flying and then some other people did as well. Um, but it wasn't until um, around 2017 um, when that work was picked up by, uh, by a group um, under Microsoft, including uh, Ian Gillard here, who's on the call. Um, and they used it in their Frigate Bird project. Um, the link to that is, is here on this slide. Um, and as part of that project, they, um, they dusted it off and rebased it on the, on the current um, RG Pilot Master. And uh, I went as far as getting it pull requested and, and brought in. Uh, into Master, which was a really great effort by them, uh, as well as being a very interesting project uh, in its own right. Um, and once it was in Master, that gave it a bit more visibility, um, and it got picked up for uh, commercial use in around 2018 um, by a company, uh, Crest Aerospace, KH Aerospace, um, who are now using this um, commercially, um, and who I, who I work for as well as, as Tom works for them as well. So why would you want to, to, to use this, um, this set of technologies? Um, well, first of all, it's very interesting, uh, at least for, uh, for someone like me, a kind of nerdy engineer. Um, so it really sits as the intersection um, of a lot of different interesting areas. Um, so you've got, uh, you've got the weather, you've got the performance of, um, of gliders and of, of, of aircraft. Um, you've got a lot of scope for um, optimization um, in how the aircraft flies. And you've also got the inspiration of, um, of how nature handles it with, with various uh, soaring birds. So, um, but as I mentioned, there's also um, commercial or industrial um, applications. And um, one that I've already mentioned is the, the Crest and Danny Aerospace K1000 uh, glider, 
um, which is a product which is really designed to take um, advantage of this technology um, of thermal soaring, as well as um, having a lot of other interesting features on the aircraft, including high efficiency solar panels um, and lots of other bells and whistles like a uh, high bandwidth data link um, and, uh, and capable payloads. Um, now this aircraft, yeah, does uh, have very good features for, for soaring. So it's got a 30 to one um, glide ratio and it's got a very long um, ability to fly due to its high battery capacity and, and solar power, which means it's a great um, experimental platform for soaring, as well as being a, a very useful um, aircraft for our customers as well. And um, Craftsman Dunning Aerospace is, a, is an RG pilot uh, partner organization. Um, but most importantly, it's a, it's a fun thing um, to experiment with. It doesn't need to be super complicated. Um, I do the majority of the testing um, on a very simple um, Volantex uh, foamy in my local flying field. And um, it's a nice way to get out and uh, enjoy the good weather when it comes along um, and, uh, and enjoy flying your gliders. Um, so a bit of a um, kind of background to what thermal soaring is to kind of create a bit of a mental model for, for the subsequent slides. Um, so there's a bit, bit of a video here showing um, a kind of time lapse of what happens um, when thermal soaring conditions exist. Um, so what you have is sunshine um, heats the air pretty much only right beside the ground. It doesn't heat the air that it passes through on the way down to the ground. And this creates a sort of blanket of warm air beside the ground. Um, and as we know, warm air likes to rise. Uh, and eventually this air breaks through the cooler air above it and rises as a bubble or a column of warmer air. Uh, and we call this a thermal. Um, and this continues up through the atmosphere until um, the expanding air due to the falling pressure cools down to the, the ambient temperature, at which point it stops rising. And um, in a lot of conditions on the way up, the water vapor that it carries from the surface will also condense out, uh, forming these, uh, these kind of classic cumulus clouds, uh, fair weather cumulus. Um, so here's another kind of visualization. So this is actually from a soaring simulator, Condor 2. And this is an advantage. It also has a, a sort of cheat mode where it will show you um, what the air is doing underneath these thermals. So you can see it's kind of sucking up warm air from a fairly wide area. Um, and that's being pulled up into the sky um, and forming a, a kind of stream of, of warm air um, going up through the atmosphere. Um, and also the wind has the effect of, of blowing these, uh, these formations uh, along with it. So if you were to take a slice through um, the atmosphere on a day like that um, with these conditions, you would you would see something like this plot. This is actually a plot from a, a LIDAR uh, measuring device pointing up into the atmosphere and measuring the vertical velocities of the air. And you would see that there's these isolated uh, columns of red, uh, which is rising air. Um, and those are surrounded by um, areas of, of blue or sinking air. Um, and overall, uh, due to conservation of mass, this um, that the whole thing balances out so that there's as much air sinking as there is rising. So in order to exploit that, we need to make sure that we spend more time flying our glider in air that's rising rather than air that's falling. And um, because it's overall average, if we just fly in a straight line and don't make any changes, the effect on the glider will average out and we won't get any net benefit. So there's kind of three groups of techniques we can use to, um, to get a net benefit and stay up for longer. So the first one is effectively what's currently implemented in the code, and that's the technique of uh, circling where the air is rising and flying in a straight line through where the air is sinking. And because you're spending then more time in the rising air, you get a net benefit. And um, there's three sort of components uh, behind how that works currently that I'll, I'll talk about in the, in the subsequent slides. However, there's also two uh, other possible techniques um, which you can use to, uh, to exploit um, these conditions and which full-size you know, manned gliders do very, very effectively. Um, and the first one, um, technique B here, is that you can adjust your airspeed so that you fly uh, at a higher airspeed through air which is uh, going down, which is sinking, um, and you slow down where the air is, is rising in the lift where the thermals are. And even without stopping to circle, this will, will allow you to get a benefit. Um, but you can also combine it with the, uh, the circling, the thermaling flight path. Um, you can combine those two techniques to get additional benefit. And this is a feature which is currently um, under development. Uh, the second half of my talk, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about um, the progress towards that. Um, but there's also a third technique, which is uh, kind of on our future um, roadmap, 
which is to actually actively navigate uh, the aircraft so that we're not just um, we're not just flying in a straight line through um, whatever thermals and, and sink we encounter, but instead we're, we're picking our way from thermal to thermal um, and along lines of lift, so that by adjusting our horizontal flight plan, uh, we can fly more through lift and, and less through sink. So the um, the first existing feature of the code um, we'll talk a bit about is the, the variometer feature. And the purpose of the variometer is to try and uh, back out what the air around the glider is doing uh, using the measurements that the autopilot on the glider actually has at its disposal. Um, and um, this can be done by effectively measuring um, the climb rate of the glider and then adding on various corrections. Um, so there's, uh, there's two principal corrections at present. So the first one is the natural sink rate uh, of the glider in still air the glide puller. So even if the air is not moving at all, um, the glider will, will descend at a rate which is related to the airspeed it's flying at. Um, and that's related through the, the, the glide puller. And the second correction is uh, an acceleration correction. And this arises because if you imagine doing a, um, a steep pull up in still air, you would, um, you would, that would result in a climb rate. However, you'd also be decelerating. Um, so we can, we can add that in as a correction to improve the, um, the estimate. And um, this estimate can be used for various purposes. And there's various filters with different timescales for different types of decision making. Um, so it can be used to decide when to stop and, and thermal. Um, it can be used for actually adjusting the flight path within that thermal to, to better harness, en harness energy. And then it can be used for decision making as when to, uh, when to give up and leave a thermal. Um, so the glide pool I've already mentioned, which is the um, the sink rate of the glider as a function of its airspeed, even in still air. And in the implementation as present, there's uh, three parameters which describe um, or parameterize this function. Um, the first one is the, uh, the K parameter, which is proportional to uh, wing loading. And what this does is it doesn't affect the glider ratio, uh, but it, it moves it um, to different airspeeds. And this is why full-size gliders have a, a good glide ratio, but it occurs at very high airspeed because they have a much higher wing loading than our small uh, models do. The second one is the CD knot parameter, which is uh, related to the zero lift drag. And this kind of comes in through the, uh, the sort of aerodynamic cleanliness of the design. Um, so if you imagine a very sleek and streamlined glider versus a, a kind of fairly rounded glider with uh, lots of antennas and so on hanging off it, that would be the difference between the value of the, the CD knot parameter in your glide puller. And the predominant effect of this parameter is to adjust um, the rate of sync at higher airspeeds. So on the middle graph there, you can see it doesn't make too much difference to the different colored lines at the lower horizontal speeds. Um, but the faster you go, the, the bigger a difference it makes. And the final parameter is the, uh, the polar B parameter. Um, and this is really related to the change of drag uh, with lift. And it's mostly related to the uh, to the aspect ratio of the glider, how skinny the wings are, as well as some other uh, parameters of the design. Um, and what this principally affects is the sink rate at the lower end of the airspeed spectrum. Um, and its effect for our kind of typical range of parameters with uh, with model gliders doesn't have as big effect as the as the other two parameters do. Um, so the, the kind of second component of the existing set of features I want to talk about is the, um, the management of the flight mode and the, the throttle. So currently, um, thermals can only be detected uh, when the aircraft is gliding because the propulsive effect, um, the thrust from the motor, would disturb the estimate of uh, what the air around the glider is doing. So the code will automatically uh, suppress the throttle um, when appropriate to allow that detection to take place. Um, However, there's, there's kind of checks and balances on that. So as the glider descends, if it doesn't then find a thermal, uh, the, the code will automatically allow the throttle to run again and it'll climb back to a suitable altitude to start that search again. Um, however, if it does find a thermal a long way, um, that's specified by the, the SOAR V-speed parameter. So if, if the air is estimated to be rising at a rate which will allow the glider to thermal at a vertical speed of soar B speed or greater, then the code um, can automatically trigger into thermal flight mode. Um, and there is an RC switch option to, uh, to suppress that capability as well, if you don't want it to do that. Um, but it can do that automatically and start thermaling. Um, and then it will, it will revert to the 
previous flight modes under a number of conditions. Um, so if the thermal climb rate drops below that specified value, or if it reaches the, um, the maximum specified altitude, it will go back to the, the flight mode you started in. And the three flight modes, which um, are sort of supported as the, um, the kind of uh, the baseline flight modes from which to switch are auto flight modes. So you can do a full auto emission and it'll stop in thermal if it finds something along the way. Um, or you can fly more interactively in flight or IB mode or cruise mode. Um, the third component of the existing feature set is the ability once you have once you have detected a thermal and stopped uh, to circle in it, you can then the code will adjust how the aircraft flies within that thermal to maximize the climb rate. And thermals, as we kind of saw in the previous videos, um, they're typically very irregular and turbulent. No two thermals are are the same. Um, but they do have some common features, so they will generally have an area of stronger lift within the thermal, typically somewhere in the middle, but they, there may be multiple areas of stronger lift. And the best strategy to maximize the climb rate of the glider once it's in a thermal is to circle around um, one of these cores of, of stronger lift. And in the code, we use a model-based strategy to do this, which requires that we have a model of what this uh, thermal distribution of lift looks like. And we use a fairly common approximation, which is the Gaussian uh, distribution of lift, which you can see here on the right, which has some of the right features. It has a, an area of stronger lift in the middle, which then has a, a smooth um, taper off towards the towards the sides. Now, this is obviously not you know, a physically accurate approximation of what a real thermal is doing, because it doesn't represent any of the, um, the, the turbulence or the non-regularity um, of real thermals. However, it is it is uh, close enough to be useful, even though it's, it's definitely a, a not a fully correct model. So what we do with that uh, that model is we use the measurements from the variometer to use uh, to feed into an EKF-like algorithm, which then estimates the four parameters of this model to um, effectively try to figure out where the center of the lift is, how strong it is, and how broad it is. So those are the four parameters of this of this model, and the um, the algorithm is EKF-like because a lot of the um, components in EKF are, um, are kind of simplified out this implementation because we don't model um, any of the, the, the time dynamics of a thermal. So we don't try to um, update the states over time. We assume that it's fixed, even though in reality it's not. And we deal with um, any changes over time um, by, uh, by just process noise in the estimator. Another major simplifying factor of this implementation is that we only have one measurement um, on any time step. We only have a measurement of the local vertical velocity from the variometer. And that, again, simplifies the maths uh, down quite a bit um, to keep that implementation uh, quite simple. And it's interesting that even though we only have one measurement and only one time step, because we're taking multiple time steps in different positions, we're able to build up this model of the four parameter uh, thermal over time. Um, and as we saw before, the, um, the thermals drift with the wind. This is captured by a feed forward term. So this estimator doesn't have to try to keep up with the, the wind drift. It already knows that it expects the thermal to drift uh, with the wind. And then the estimated position of the central core of the thermal is then used as the, um, the target loiter point uh, using the L1 controller. So this is a kind of uh, result that you get from applying this. This is a, a plot of uh, a climb um, in a thermal. And um, the, the kind of multicolored uh, trace is the, the track of the aircraft colored by the vertical air velocity estimates to be in that position at that particular time. And the blue line in the middle is the estimated location, uh, central location of the thermal that it's, that it's trying to track. You can see at the bottom of this, when it first enters, there's quite a lot of variation in, in that estimate. And then it settles down a little bit um, as we get a, a quite a constant climb rate in the lower third of the thermal. Then as we get higher, as we saw before, thermals are very irregular. So they, they change shape over time and they, they don't fully obey the, the drifting of the wind that it expects. So in this example, we start to encounter areas of, of sink on, on the kind of um, the westerly side of the, of the thermal. And at that point, the estimator tries to shift the estimate to the better center in the lift and move the aircraft more to the to the east, to the, um, the kind of right rear of this plot. Um, and as I mentioned, there's four, four parameters, and those are basically the states of this estimator. And they evolve uh, over time, uh, like in this example. Now, um, 
recent progress kind of within this uh, set of features. Um, so there's been a large number of tweaks driven by um, the increased level of testing that we've had in, in actual environments. So that's led to a number of improvements um, to various aspects of how the variometer functions um, and also various factors about how the EKF thermal centering operate to make it more robust and, and avoid um, some vulnerabilities that were found and improve the performance in a wider range of conditions. And the second broad category is kind of improved ease of use of this feature. So um, we now have uh, thermal flight mode. Previously, we were doing thermaling in loiter flight mode in a kind of special case of loiter. And that could be quite confusing um, for users, but also it limited. Um, it meant that you didn't have loiter available for normal loiter type things. Um, so separating that out gives us better flexibility and makes it a bit clearer to the user what's actually happening when the aircraft uh, changes flight mode. Um, so that kind of um, separation out has also enabled uh, some other features to be added. Um, so the first one is the um, separate parameter for the um, the bank angle or the flight path radius to use when thermaling. So again, previously we we're using the general uh, loiter radius. Um, and this was um, not very flexible in that you had to change that parameter if you wanted to do something other than thermaling, you'd, you'd have to switch it around. Um, but also it meant that the, the default values weren't very suitable for thermaling, um, whereas having a thermaling specific parameter allows us to have a more general default that will be more suitable for a wider category of users. Um, so Flybywire and, uh, Fly and B and Cruise climb capability. So previously, the ability to automatically climb back to altitude and uh, start gliding again to search for thermals again, that was only included in auto mode. It wasn't um, included in Flybor B or cruise mode. And what would happen in Flybor B and cruise mode would be that um, the aircraft would descend to the minimum altitude and then it would um, it would go into RTL mode. And that wasn't um, you know very uh, satisfactory for users, especially people flying long distance with FPV. Um, so having this ability to climb back to altitude and start another thermal search uh, is much better for, the, for those users. We now have more RC switch options. Um, so the, the user by toggling the switch can invoke different actions. So um, if they're already thermaling, it can, it can tell the aircraft to, to leave the thermal. Um, and we also have a, um, a kind of a, a middle option on the switch. So we have a switch option to completely disable soaring. We have a switch option to enable um, all the features. Then we have an intermediate position, which um, enables uh, gliding and, and enables the variometer, but it disables automatically changing flight mode. So the user can still trigger thermal flight mode via their, their mode switch, but the code won't do it automatically if they, if they don't want to do. We've done a number of um, documentation improvements to make the setup process easier for users. And we've also developed a glide polar calculation spreadsheet tool to help them estimate these three parameters I mentioned before. Uh, based upon the measurements of their glider and the, um, the results of, of glide testing in still air. So um, that kind of sums up the current state of the code and the recent progress made on those existing features. Um, so that's 20 minutes in. So I'll pause for any questions at this point before we go on to um, kind of the areas of, of active development. So I'm curious, Samuel, about the the radius, I mean, you're trying to circle the core of a thermal. Um, yep. Clearly, there's more lift towards the center of the core. So, you know, that would tend to push you towards a, a narrow radius circle uh, to get more of that lift. But then you'd be at a high bank angle. So that's less efficient flying. Is there a sort of a theoretical way to balance that, to optimize that radius? And, and is that there something is. that is dependent on the flight conditions? There is, yeah. So, um, so you're right. So there's a trade-off there between getting in closer to the core of the thermal in the stronger lift, but turning tighter and having a, a higher um, drag effectively and a higher sink rate relative to the air. And um, for any set of, of aircraft characteristics and set of thermal characteristics, there is an optimum uh, thermal radius and bank angle that gives you the best climb rate. Um, however, to, to come up with that optimum, you need to um, have a good estimate of the uh, distribution of lift within the thermal. And that really comes down to how strong it is and how broad it is. Now, um, fortunately in our implementation, we actually estimate both of those parameters using the, uh, the EKF. So it would be possible to, um, to use that information 
to dynamically update the uh, the flight path radius to maximize the climb rate. So that, that might be a future area of um, of possible improvement. Um, there is one caveat to that, which is um, it's kind of subtle, but um, even though we have these four parameters um, that characterize the thermal, when we're in a constant steady state turn around the core of the thermal, two of those parameters um, become confounded and they become difficult to, to estimate independently. And those two things are the strength and the radius. And you can kind of um, understand this by thinking about if you're in a, a very strong thermal, but it's very narrow versus um, a weaker thermal, but it's very broad, at some radius, the the, the updraft strength will be the same. And if you're thermaling at that um, at that uh, radius, you can't tell whether you're in a strong, narrow thermal or a slightly weaker, broader thermal. So those two parameters are quite difficult to estimate. And that's why up till now, we haven't tried to use that information to dynamically update the, the bank angle because they, so, they tend to become slightly confounded. How much would you need to weave in the circle if you had a sort of a rippled circle? You right. know, uh, like a sewing pattern type circle, you know, would that give you enough observability? It would. It would, yeah. And the nice thing about the EKF implementation is that it does have a covariance matrix. So um, even though it can't um, accurately estimate these two parameters, what it, it knows that it can't do this from the observability um, calculations. So it knows that these two parameters are confounded. So the covariance term on those two states becomes very high. Uh, over time, because it knows it can't independently estimate them. So as soon as you actually go out of a circular flight path, it will very quickly um, use that high uh, covariance term to update the estimates to make them more accurate. Um, so what we actually need to exploit that is, is yeah, a heuristic that says that every now and again, rather than fly a perfect circle, fly more of an oval uh, to actually get that other information from different radii. Could you even fly like a bow tie pattern and actually go right through the middle and that would right. give you great lift in the middle at the expense of some steeper bank angles. But that would also give you great observability, I would have thought, if you flew a bow tie. Yeah, absolutely. And there's various um, kind of ways of, of handling this in the literature. So various um, different groups have tried just perturbing um, the flight path radius a little bit and see if that improves things or, or makes things worse. Um, I think that there's, there's some issues with that just because the thermals are naturally very variable. So you don't really know um, if you, you know, how long do you need to sample over to actually estimate that accurately. Whereas the DKF, you know, because it has a, a better handling of noise, it kind of has a more natural way of handling that. Possible future. Uh, Thanks very much. So, probably enough questions from me. Anyone else? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I should just I should just point out that's you know that's exactly what we tried to address with our Bombysaw algorithm at um, you know, at Microsoft. So um, so it tries to balance that exploration and exploitation, you know, to explore the thermal and learn the parameters of the EKF, and then you know once it's got a good lock, it tries to exploit them, and you know it's choosing those it's choosing actions optimally. So it's not necessarily just circling. It could be doing something like a bow tie or whatever it decides is the the best way to, to do that exploration and exploitation you know, in the most optimal manner. So, um, yeah, it'd be really nice to get some of those uh, those features in. Right. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask how tight you're turning? Uh, what what sort of bank angles you're using? Because like I I, when yeah. I I used to fly thermal soaring, like you know full size thermal soaring, and um, it's a, it was actually one of the first things that got me interested in using autopilots. So um, yeah, so what sort of bank angles are you holding in the turn and, and, and have you sort of got, are you working on an optimal bank angle versus lift type per equation to choose that? Yeah, great question. Um, so yeah, I've also kind of in the last couple of years got into full size soaring as well. And um, with full size soaring, they, they really turn tight, um, you know, especially, uh, maybe especially in Scotland, I think because the thermals are quite weak and narrow typically, but um, 45 degrees is kind of, kind of standard for a full size glider. Um, for, for models, it's kind of an area of, of, or UAVs, it's kind of an area for investigation. So I've, I've found that um, typically for, in my testing, a little bit wider works, works better. Um, so maybe 30 degrees of, of bank or so works quite well. Um, but it, that's not really based upon 
yeah, any kind of um, optimality. That's that's really just based on on experience. So right now we leave it up to the user uh, what they choose, um, but it, it would be a great feature to have that um, calculated dynamically. Yeah, because even I also fly. Um... Well, I haven't for a while, but uh, a model like a like high performance um, F three B sort of uh, uh, F three F sort of um, uh, thermal saurus, and you know they crank it like you know you notice when you when you can core a thermal well and and you especially low down once you get higher up where I assume you guys are working. You know perhaps your the thermals are so large compared to the aircraft. You know, it's uh, you know uh, the bank angle is much less important than a full-sized aircraft, for example. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a factor. So yeah, so the the kind of scale of the typical uh, lift structures changes uh, based on how high up high up you are. So yeah, when you're when you're low down, like the um, the F three B guys and so on, they're kind of turning in, in tiny little bubbles of, of lift and little eddies. So they really need to turn tight to exploit them because they are typically down quite low. Um, and as you get higher up, those structures become more um, more large scale. The kind of areas of lift come together to form larger columns, um, and that's how the full that's where the full scale gliders fly is is in the kind of upper half of the um, of the boundary layer. For that reason, that the thermals are stronger and wider, and that's where you know when we're doing uh, commercial operations, that's where we'll typically be operating as well. So the lift structures are are wider there, so we can afford to to turn a bit a bit looser. Um, but it is, I think that probably doing that dynamically um, would be a fairly major effort. Um, so right now we kind of leave it up to the user to specify, but fortunately um, there's a kind of, by specifying it using a, a bank angle rather than a turn radius, we kind of, um, we reduce the, the variability a little bit because lighter, um, lighter aircraft flying at lower flight speeds will typically want to turn a tighter radius and um, parameterizing that as a bank angle it kind of comes naturally so while like a full-scale glider would be turning you know maybe a 150 meter radius or something um it might do so at the same bank angle that uh, a, a small model would turn at a 10 or 15 meter radius um the the uh prediction your gaussian um lift model um that would sort of somewhat that that should be sort of spitting out like a, a an idea of the radius of the lift, um, and and from that a an indication of what the well some idea of what a at least a a, a suboptimal radius would be. Um, That's right. So, so there should there, like a very least a sort of a maximum radius that you should be turning. So there might be a an opportunity at least there to sort of say, look, um, you should be. We, we we perhaps should be increasing our bank angle here or or something like that that's right yeah so yeah i think we'd probably to do something like that we need what tridge mentioned and, and what what ian did previously which is to perturb the flight path to gather that additional information to improve the confidence in the estimate um that, that would definitely be a nice thing to, to have in the feature set no awesome love it hi <laughs> <laughs> nice, sam um, right. So you mentioned that um, you're suppressing throttle specifically to be able to detect the thermals. Um, what what would you need in addition to be able to uh, remove that constraint? Would you need to make any additional measurements so that we might be able to use motor gliders to push through regions of um, like high sink as well? Yep. So uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so right. So this is this is an area for kind of active um, development. Um, so there's. Shall I continue with this, or are there any other kind of burning questions before I continue on? Okay. So, um, so yeah. So right now, um, to sum up, we only detect thermals when there is um, propulsion suppressed because um, we don't have an adequate correction for what um, what effects the propulsion introduces, and um, this this actually can cause a problem in some conditions. Um, so if we if we have um, a situation where we, we want to use uh, soaring, we want to use thermaling, um, but the conditions aren't quite strong enough um, to, to remain um, airborne purely using uh, thermaling, we end up in this, um, this kind of uh, gliding descent and then followed by a climb and then a gliding descent. So we end up with this kind of sawtoothed uh, climb glide um, sequence. And this can be a, a bit of a problem. Um, 
So for a, kind of a few different types of vehicles. So if your vehicle has quite a low climb rate relative to its, its descent rate, this can mean that you actually spend a substantial proportion of the, of the time uh, climbing back up before you start another glide. And there's a good chance that you'll, you'll be climbing straight through uh, the thermal that you, you'd like to be harnessing, so you miss it. Um, and then secondly, for vehicles which have very highly optimized propulsion systems, so the Crescent Down Aerospace K1000 is definitely in this category. We spend a long time uh, designing propellers and, and optimizing propulsion systems to get a very low um, cruising power. So the efficiency is optimized at the at one cruising condition, uh, which is a steady state, uh, constant altitude condition. And the kind of climb glide uh, cycle is overall less efficient. This actually shows up in some of the uh, data from our, our 12 hour flight, um, which you can see here. So um, there's a couple of uh, features to point out in this. So um, what we have is a few different kind of phases within this flight. So we have the, the takeoff phase uh, right at the start, followed by a steady state cruising phase for the first um, sort of four hours, really. And then after the first roughly four hours, we start to see thermal activity. Um, and we, uh, we, we want to start utilizing that using soaring. However, the thermal activity isn't quite strong enough, as I mentioned, to, to have a sustaining flight um, all the time with those times we're descending and hitting the minimum altitude and, and motoring back up. And due to the uh, reduced efficiency of the propulsion system when climbing, this actually results in an increase in the average power for those time periods. So even though we're spending some of the time thermaling, the reduction in propulsive efficiency is still overcoming that. And our average power consumption is higher uh, in, those, in those points. So that happens um, at the start of the day or kind of um, when the thermals are just beginning. And it happens um, at one point in the middle of the day when the thermals just happen to die off over, over our, our area. Then it happens again towards the end of the day when the thermals start to, to taper off. And all three of those um, uh, occurrences are accompanied by an increase in the, um, the average power consumption. Um, the yellow is the, the solar uh, generation for this, for this vehicle. Uh, so not relevant to this discussion. Um, so that, that's a problem. So we'd really like to, um, to get the efficiency um, back to, or the average power consumption back to no greater than the average. Uh, you know, it should really be better than average if we're doing some thermaling, it shouldn't be higher than average. Um, and also for aircraft flying missions, which have restricted altitude profiles, um, reducing this uh, climb glide cycle uh, makes it easier to uh, to interface with ATC and to remain within your altitude uh, permits. So um, to kind of um, reiterate exactly what's happening there, so this is a kind of a, a, a simulated example um, of that same um, mission profile. So take off long period of cruise, uh, constant power, um, and then period of this sawtooth pattern, which has a higher average power due to the, the greater power during climb, and then periods of thermaling um, interspersed with, with periods of, uh, of higher power due to climb glide. Now, what we'd really like to do is to get to something like this, where um, we, we cruise in steady state, and then we have soaring enabled, but even if there's no thermals, we want to have the power no higher than the, the cruising power. Um, and then we want to be able to, to thermal and, uh, and not use any propulsive power. And if the thermals die off, we want to go back to a cruising power, but, but no more than that. And then at the end of the day, we want to go straight back to cruising power and not have any, uh, any higher power uh, areas. So to do that, we want to detect the thermals from the, the steady state cruise condition. And this requires us to add on a correction to the, the variometer estimate. So we had this same equation before, apart from now we've got this um, propulsive term. And um, actually we have already all the information that we need to add this on. So the text already knows from its parameters how much um, specific um, power it, it's putting into the propulsive system as a, by using, looking at the maximum climb rate, the maximum throttle and the, the trim values. So um, we can actually already use this to, to correct the, um, the estimate. And this then allows us to, um, to be able to detect thermal straight from the cruise condition, which um, it kind of has, has pros and cons. Um, so right now it's implemented as a, um, if for testing, it's not yet uh, PR'd as a kind of separate soaring mode, if you set soar enable to two rather than one, you get this, um, you get this behavior. So the, the pros are that you, 
you reduce the user intervention. So for these very long missions, uh, obviously this isn't relevant to most users, but if you're doing very long missions, you don't have to make a decision about when to enable soaring. Um, you can actually have it enabled all the time because there's no um, there's no trade-off with this increased power consumption. Um, you improve the efficiency while you're waiting for thermals to, to fill in. Um, you're able to detect more of the thermals because you're not spending some time climbing through them. Um, you don't have this, uh, makes it easier to interface with ATC due to the reduced altitude variation. Um, and it's, um, it's less intrusive to your kind of general mission profile. If you're trying to fly a payload and you don't want to be um, doing this climb glide, then that's better as well. And it's also potentially more applicable to uh, kind of general usage of, uh, of aircraft. If people are flying, you know, if people are out for a kind of FPV joyride, they don't necessarily want to have this uh, kind of fairly um, intrusive climb glide cycle uh, that comes about through soaring. Maybe they just want to cruise at a constant altitude, but they want to be able to opportunistically take advantages of, of thermals if they, if they happen to run into one. So there are a couple of cons, however. So there's the... Once this is enabled, the accuracy of the text parameters then feeds into the um, ability and the accuracy of thermal detections. So if you're flying in extremely marginal conditions where you really want to tell the difference between a thermal, which just allows you to, to climb at your specified rate and one which doesn't quite, then errors in these parameters will, will reduce the accuracy. However, it doesn't affect the accuracy of actually centering a thermal because once we start thermaling, the throttle is then suppressed again so the the accuracy estimate goes back to whatever it was so that error will be removed um and that those kind of parameter settings just induce a little bit more scope for, for user error but um overall for people who are flying vehicles which which um are well set up um i think the pros vastly outweigh the cons um so any questions on that on that aspect before I go on to the, the kind of next feature under development. 40 minutes in now to the talk. Okay. So the next um, the next kind of aspect under development is um, what I mentioned previously uh, with regards to the kind of second technique, technique B, which you can use to exploit um, the, uh, the lifting thermals. And uh, this can be used with, with the circling flight path or as a second uh, separate method. But essentially, um, what this relies on is changing the airspeed dynamically um, to maximize um, the, the performance of the aircraft given what the air around it is doing. So um, whenever we're gliding from a given altitude, um, what we really want to do is we want to maximize how far we glide because that will give us the um, two things. It will give us the, the widest area possible for detecting thermals. So we, the further we glide, the more chances that we actually intersect a thermal and start to exploit it. Uh, but secondly, we also probably want to make some kind of progress towards um, whatever objective we have um, in our mission. Now, if the air is, is still, when we have the, um, the best glide speed for the aircraft, um, and um, that is essentially the, the, the airspeed which gives you the, this furthest distance. And um, this plot shows the uh, the glide puller of the aircraft. So it's the vertical speed of the aircraft as a function of its horizontal speed. And this um, way of drawing it is kind of graphical method of estimating the best speed to fly at to get the furthest distance. And what you essentially do is you draw a line from the origin of the plot, which uh, just intersects tangent to the, the glide puller. And in this case, that occurs at um, effectively the minimum airspeed of, of 16 meters per second. Um, so 16 meters per second is the airspeed you should fly at to maximize your, um, your glide ratio, your, the distance you can travel for a given height. However, usually in between thermals, we, we don't have still air. Usually we have some sink, which is balancing out the, the lifting air in the thermals. And usually we have um, headwinds or tailwinds um, which affect this calculation. So um, this plot is the same as before, apart from it shows what is the effect of having um, an additional vertical speed component due to air movement, WZ, and an additional um, horizontal air movement, uh, WX, due to wind, headwind. And you can see that if we draw the same diagram, uh, we now have uh, a much shorter distance that we can travel um, due to the effect of these, of these adverse wind conditions. And that then means that um, the optimum airspeed to fly at is now different. 
And there's a, a theory which tells us um, what's, what's the new optimal speed. And we can, we can again use the same graphical construction technique where we, for this example of one meters per second of sync, we move the glide puller down to add that one meter per second onto the, uh, the original vertical speed. And then we repeat that tangent process and we come up with a new airspeed, uh, which as we expect is higher. So if we're flying in sync, we expect to want to fly faster to get through it. And the new airspeed has now gone from 16 meters per second all the way up to 21 meters per second, just with one meter per second of sync, which isn't, isn't actually a huge amount. So it's, it's quite, a big, quite a big change. Um, but usually to kind of simplify the diagrams, rather than redraw the, the drag puller, the glide puller, usually we just draw this intercept uh, to a different point on the graph. So rather than drawing the intercept line through the zero zero point, we draw it through the um, through the, the vertical point corresponding to the, the level of sync. We get the same result that 21 meters per second is the, the best speed to fly at. And this also works for headwinds as well. So in that case, we, we offset the, um, the starting point of the tangent uh, by the sync speed and the headwind speed. And this example shows that if we're flying in one meter per second of sync and five meters per second of headwind, um, now we need to fly at um, 23 meters per second to maximize our, our distance traveled. So we're already, you know, we're creeping up and up as we add more and more effects. Um, what if we know, however, that we actually are expecting to find a thermal up ahead of us that will give us a, a certain uh, climb rate that we expect? Um, well, fortunately, this theory, amazingly, also works for this um, situation. And what we do is we add that effect, forgetting about headwind for now, we add the expected climb rate on as an additional uh, vertical offset to the starting point of the tangent. And what this tells us is that if we're expecting to find lift ahead, that means we should fly, uh, fly faster. And what this is now solving for is rather than the distance uh, that you can travel for a given height, it's actually optimizing now the average uh, speed uh, cross country from thermal to thermal, um, which is, is quite amazing that the same technique works for, for both uh, scenarios. Um, and it's, it's quite nice that to, to combine the effects of sync and an expected thermal, you just add those two numbers together as the vertical um, offset. Um, and this also works fine for, for headwinds as well. You just add that offset to the graph as well and draw a new uh, intercept. And um, in this, in this example, we've got the three sort of combined effects, which if we're flying in one meter per second of sync, we've got a five meter per second headwind, and we're expecting a two meter per second thermal climb at some point in the future. This is now telling us that rather than fly at our 16 meter per second still air uh, best glide speed, we should now fly up at nearly 31 meters per second. So a massive uh, change of optimum airspeed um, in a, a fairly realistic um, set of conditions. Now, typically full-size manned gliders, um, because they fly at a higher airspeed, so they're typically flying somewhere between maybe 60 and 90 knots for a, a cross-country flight. The effect of a 10 to 20 knot um, headwind is, is, is actually uh, significant, but it doesn't change this too much. And they can afford to add that on later as a kind of correction. So what they typically do is because lift and sink, um, lift or sink in the current between the thermals has the same effect as the the expected climb rate in the next thermal, they take those two parameters, lump them together, and they do effectively a 1D lookup for what the best speed to fly is. And they very cleverly do this by adding a, an, ex, an additional uh, ring to their variometer, which allows them to adjust their expected climb rate and read off what the best speed to fly is. Um, however, for us flying uh, models or, or UAVs, typically a, a lower flight speed, so it might be as low as you know, 20 knots for a, for a FOMI, um, so that the effect of a 10 to 20 knot headwind is, is going to be catastrophic. We really want to capture this, um, this effect of wind um, in, our, in our calculation. Uh, so we need to retain the more complex um, uh, relationship. And the kind of graphical solution that I presented before, that can also be written out as, a, as an optimization problem. Um, and this is what we um, have implemented, and this is what is currently being tested uh, to, to maximize the um, the, uh, to get the best speed to fly. So there's um, this rather imposing looking <laughs> equation, but don't worry, I've, I've solved it for you. Um, and this has really got um, a few, few inputs. So it's got uh, V thermal, which is the expected climb rate in the next thermal. Um, and that comes straight from the, the SOAR V speed parameter. 
we've got the um, the wind component um, along your 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 course over ground, which comes from the HRS. And then we've got the the local wind between the thermals, the vertical uh, wind component, lift or sink, which comes from the variometer estimate. And um, I said I solved it, but actually there is no solution to this, um, so it has to be solved numerically. Um, and this is done with a, a Newton method uh, solver. And um, what we do here is we um, we just run. So, it, so this is the shape of the of the solution, I should say. So um, for any um, um, so this is the shape of what the solution looks like. So it's a fairly well-behaved solution, uh, which is why Newton method works quite well. And typically Newton method will converge in um, three or four iterations. Uh, will get you very close to the final um, answer. Um, however, we'd rather not do, um, you know, a, a kind of um, multiple iterations per loop inside the soaring controller. So rather than do that, we actually just generate a new solution on every, uh, every call uh, through the soaring controller. It just does one iteration of Newton. And it starts from the um, the previous estimate uh, from the previous loop using the new inputs. So the inputs change, um, but they actually change not too quickly compared to the loop rate because these are all uh, filtered estimates. Um, and that means that the previous solution um, is actually a fairly good approximation to uh, to the solution to the current set of inputs. And we just do one single update iteration, and then we use that as the as the speed to fly. Now, although this method never actually converges because the, the inputs are also changing on every time step. It actually gives better accuracy than if we were to uh, freeze the inputs and do multiple loops uh, over multiple, uh, multiple iterations over multiple loops um, because we allow the inputs to change uh, continuously. So it never converges, but it's, uh, it gives good accuracy. And um, the initial uh, flight data from this implementation has been uh, fairly promising. So, um, in the final implementation, there'll be more smoothing associated with this, but you can already see that there's a correlation between the um, the red uh, in the top plot, which is the, the local sync rate, and the calculated speed to fly uh, in, in the bottom plot. Plotting it out like this makes it a bit easier to see. So for any measured local sync rate on the x-axis, we're coming up with a, um, a best speed to fly on the y-axis. And um, this has been binned according to what the, uh, the horizontal wind speed is. So you can also see that for any given sync rate, um, a greater a greater wind component, um, a greater headwind component, which is more negative, uh, results at a higher airspeed as expected. Now there are a few um, oddities to this plot. So there's some, there's a bit of a gap um, here, in that no no measured sync rate will result in an airspeed which is between 10 and 11 meters per second, and this turns out to be due to um, a missing term in uh, one of the special cases we need to implement for when to fly the minimum airspeed. Um, so that gap will be will be fixed. And this appears to have resulted in some spurious solutions, uh, which is probably due to this uh, discontinuity um, and the Newton method not quite converging uh, or not converging adequately on a single uh, iteration. Um, so I expect in future flight testing, once this missing term is input, um, those spurious solutions should, should go away. If not, we'll deal with them uh, some other way. Um, in terms of how this is going to be set up, so there's going to be a new parameter soar cruise airspeed, and um, for that one, zero will be the kind of default, which will be disabled, which will mean it uses the trim airspeed uh, in between in between thermals. Greater than one uh, will mean that um, you just fly a, a fixed specified airspeed, so it won't do this calculation, but it will give you the ability to just say, I want you to fly at 15 meters per second um, as a separate um, setting from trim airspeed, um, and then finally minus one will be automatic, meaning do this calculation and work out what you think is the optimum speed to fly at. So um, some kind of big pros from this will be improved performance. Um, so I really expect that this will improve a lot um, the kind of average sync rate in between thermals and allow us to really maximize how far we can travel um, and um, generally improve the performance of the aircraft when soaring a lot. Um, Secondly, there's going to be less user intervention. So right now, when running these long missions on the K1000, but also more generally, um, the user, if they're flying through a large area of sync, um, they might interactively set up a higher airspeed to get through that. Um, and this will now automatically be taken care of. Um, potential cons. So um, because this relies on a number of different um, estimates, for example, the, the polar parameters, um, feed into it and, and various other things. There's a little bit of additional scope for, for user error in setting those up. 
this will be more of an advanced feature to enable once the aircraft is, is flying uh, correctly in other ways with soaring. And then secondly, there are some potential new couplings between errors in the, um, in the glide polar um, and how the speed to fly theory operates. Um, so that's still to be, to be worked out whether there is a, any instability there. And, and if so, how we'll, how we'll deal with it. But I don't expect it to be a, a big problem. So to wrap up, I think it's a really big potential benefit uh, from this um, from this method. Uh, it does need a bit more refinement. You can see here one plot from a flight of the K1000, where this is quite nice because it shows um, it shows the amount of uh, lift and sink we're measuring as we fly between thermals. And here you can definitely see that there's areas where we're flying through neutral air or slightly rising air, and then areas where we're flying through big sink. So this adaptive airspeed will really help out with that. So that's um, that's kind of the speed to fly. Um, so to wrap up, so there's only five minutes left, so I'll wrap up fairly quickly. Um, so with, with with soaring in general, you know, as we've already discussed with some other possible improvements, there's there's massive potential for future um, optimizations and future features to improve uh, the performance of this kind of aircraft. Um, but also, I think that the the current features would really benefit from a wider uh, community of users and, and testing. Um, and towards that, there's a few things I've been looking at. So improved documentation I've already mentioned, and I'll continue to, to work on that to make it easier for people to get into it. Um, but also there's the potential for maybe opening up to uh, operation of aircraft, which don't have an airspeed sensor, which is a current stipulation is that the aircraft must have an airspeed sensor. It may be possible to relax that, um, obviously with some performance decrement, but it might still be useful to get those users um, enabled. So more challenging, Simulated test cases would be would be nice. We have a, a fairly simplistic test case in the in the SITL simulator, uh, which is run um, as part of the auto test suite, and then we have some more complex interactive uh, simulators. Um, however, having some more realistic uh, automated test cases would be really great to validate some of this um, more advanced capability. Then the last one I have here is um, a lot of these features are quite difficult to reliably benchmark outside of simulation. And that's because the conditions we're trying to exploit are uh, fundamentally stochastic and non-repeatable. So if you're trying to fly the same aircraft twice in different versions of the code or different features enabled, you can't expect to get a reliable um, idea, except in a very kind of probabilistic sense about whether the, um, whether the change made an improvement. One way of getting around that is to, um, to have multiple aircraft flying in the same weather conditions. And this is something that um, I think is going to be very big uh, this year. So I've, I've actually got set up with, with multiple almost identical aircraft, which I'm going to use to uh, to do back-to-back -back testing of, of different variations. And then finally, to kind of leave you with this <laughs> very quickly. So this is um, the kind of future potential for the third technique I mentioned, which is doing um, more intelligent route planning across across between different thermals and this you know is really a, a kind of future future effort and it may be something which which has to run on a companion computer or a more complex system but the idea with this is that we we have a bunch of information already about where we might expect to find better lift conditions and that can come from knowledge of the of the terrain so different terrain features are more likely to generate lift and thermals uh, as well as different weather conditions for example the, the wind direction and the sun angle um, so we might use that to work out a kind of a priori map of where we expect to find thermals. However, um, even better might be if we do have multiple aircraft for certain missions. This is more probably for the, the commercial, the industrial application. But if there are multiple aircraft flying in a swarm, then they can start to share information. So if one of them happens to encounter a thermal, it can then communicate that to the other aircraft. Uh, they can use that within their route planning to do a better job of uh, preferentially flying through, through better conditions. So that's that's the end of my talk. So um, so we're quite close to the top of the hour. So if there's any any uh, any questions, let's let's have them quickly. <laughs> well, we don't need to rush it. It's, uh, we can go a few minutes over if we need to. It's a fascinating talk. I really really appreciate it, Samuel. I'm very interested in the the non airspeed operation. And one thing that might be worth looking at is um, we could use the replay facility in the EKF to allow us to rerun flight logs uh, without the airspeed sensor and look at the estimated airspeed and estimated wind um, on. So that means any of your flights you do with an airspeed sensor, you could then get run a script over it to see how well it would have done, at least on the, key, the, you know, the airspeed and the wind estimate, which is the key thing, I guess. 
um, if you hadn't had an airspeed sensor. And that might allow you to start providing some advice on, on how well it might perform um, and, and make that, that decision as to whether it's recommended. Um, that should be, we'd need a small tweak to replay to allow us to disable the airspeed input, but that should be, be quite easy. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be really interesting. And maybe as a kind of extension to that, we could also bring in some of the soaring features into the replay, so the soaring estimator. I have a kind mm. of a local replay capability using, um, using my MATLAB tools. Um, mm. But if we could do that same technique and, and assess how much impact there would be on, on those um, bits of code, that would also be, be quite useful in making that decision. Yeah, yeah, definitely worth looking at. So questions from others. Yeah, <clears throat> a really, really great talk. Thanks, Sam. Um, what, what, um, what simulators have you integrated now with with this? Yeah, so I think I think back in back when Frigatebird was was running, uh, you guys did a lot of work with with Silent Wings, if I remember. Um, yeah. So there's there's that there's that one which hasn't really received as much use as it as it should. Um, but the one which I'm working more with now is uh, is called Condor Condor Two. Yeah. Um, and that, that one's quite interesting because it's, I think it's a bit more actively developed um, than Silent Wings is, um, but also it's got a really great community around it. So um, at my kind of local full-size soaring club, um, they do weekly, you know, weekly sessions where they will go and fly uh, in Condor. And even amongst those very experienced soaring pilots, it's got a great reputation for the accuracy of the weather conditions. I think they described it as uh, frighteningly accurate, <laughs> frighteningly realistic. Yeah. So that's a that's a really great um, kind of uh, recommendation from that community about how useful that might be for actually tuning up some of these features. But you you haven't got that working with Subtle yet. That's that's future work. Um, so it, it is working. Um, so it does need yeah. does need a bit more work. Um, but yeah, that for future, I think that's going to be quite important. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Is there any well? Is, so, is there any plans to um, maybe do some parameter learning as well? Um, you know, like the glide. I think the glide polar. Yeah. Know, maybe for some users, that's something they're just not really uh, going to bother with, or or maybe they, you know, they up change the weight of their, their they put some ballast on and forget to change it or something like that. Like maybe being able to learn that glide polar would be quite a useful addition, perhaps. Is that something? You yeah, that's right. So. Yeah, so I've actually that's actually implemented and it's, it's had some testing already. I haven't included okay. it in the talk just due to time, um, but that is that is implemented um, and it does it does work actually. I've used that on on my gliders. Um, yeah. However, that that again does need a, does need a bit more testing and it it does um, it doesn't completely remove the uh, possibility of error. So, but to accurately estimate the glide puller, you need to be flying in still air conditions. That, that's that's one thing. Yeah. And you also need to be able to hold airspeed uh, fairly accurately as well. Um, so it's kind of a you know it's kind of an open question whether um, it's better just to uh, just to estimate from from glide testing or whether to use this online learning. Um, but it, it does exist, so I'll point you at it uh, for your testing as well. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so if that's the end of the questions, then uh, thank you uh, very much to Samuel for a fantastic talk, really enjoyable. Um, and uh, I greatly appreciate the, the detail in the, in the slides and uh, looking forward to seeing some flying in our local flying field with Ian. So um, up next, I'll, I'll just switch over the recording ready for starting recording the, the next talk. And uh, up next we have Richard. And so, Richard, are you ready with your talk? I am. Oh, am I audible? Uh, you are audible. Yes, that's, that's yes, looking yes. good. I am I'm um, very much ready. OK, you ready? All right, so I'll start recording for the next session. And um, so, uh, so welcome to Richard. So uh, Richard's going to be uh, talking about the object avoidance uh, changes in RG Parler. There's been a lot of work in object avoidance um, over the last year. And so Rishard has been leading the charge on that. And um, over to you, Rishard. Uh, just a second, let me just share my screen. Sure.
Right. Um, am I visible? Yeah, looking good. Right. OK. So uh, thank you so much, Andrew, for the int introduction. And uh, congratulations to the last speaker. That was an amazing, really interesting talk. So uh, moving on with the uh, obstacle avoidance. Right, so uh, not, not a lot of you actually know about me. I'm a fairly recent addition to RD Pilot. So just a little introduction about me. I'm an undergrad student, uh, fairly young, 22 years old, at, uh, and I study at Pitts Plani, India. It's a famous university here in India. And uh, the first PR I made was a little, you know, a one in, um, almost uh, one and a half years back in uh, June, 2019. And uh, the, the, actually the very first uh, experience I had with uh, audio pilot was back in my first year in college, when I saw a couple of seniors who were flying with, uh, you know, those APM 2.6 uh, boards. And uh, just, it was just amazing to see, you know, how well those, even, even those old copters flew. So I decided, you know, let's just gather a team of people and make RD pilot, make RD pilot supported copters just for fun. So uh, we we got around, you know, we have we we a bunch of really enthusiastic people, and we got about hundred people to sign up, and all of us actually made uh, more than hundred quadcopters and flew it, and none of us actually knew how to fly them. So it was all a huge scramble with, you know, all of us flying in stabilized mode, and none of us actually knowing. Uh, what to do, and we broke about 50 uh, propellers that day. So that was my introduction with flying, and of course the first PR came a few years later. And uh, subsequently, I started, uh, you know, preparing for Google Summer of Code. For those of you who don't know what uh, Google Summer of Code is, um, it's a three-month program. Now, now it has been shrunk to about half, but it's a three-month program that Google sponsors for students like myself to uh, interact with open source organizations and you know, work with them, work with the industry leaders in, uh, but only in open source organizations, much like uh, RD Pilot. And uh, I was subsequently selected uh, as a Google Summer of Code student at RD Pilot and was tasked with improving the obstacle avoidance features that we support. So uh, obstacle avoidance was a, uh, was a recent addition. It's not, it's not as old as you know, most features in audio pilot is. It's, 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 it's something that is quite recent. So uh, uh, my task was to you know, figure out, uh, actually Randy did most of the work of figuring out you know, what, what was there to be improved and what were the bugs, but my job was to fix them. Ever since then, uh, I have been an active tester, an active developer, and uh, most recently, this uh, just 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 March ending, I was uh, also selected uh, to be part of the dev team, one of the newest members of the audio pilot dev team. So uh, thanks for that. Uh, just an outline of uh, what can you expect from this talk today. Uh, so today I am. Uh, just going to give you an overview of the entire setup of how you know we gather data from the sensors and uh, how do we process it how do we store it on board and then uh, you know how do these algorithms actually use these data and uh, so about half the presentation is actually just videos it's like a movie uh, the first half might be a bit boring about gathering gathering uh, the data but the rest of the half is just just purely videos and uh, should be fun so uh, obstacle avoidance um, is of majorly two types in audio pilot. And that's because we have, you know, we have the autonomous flying modes and we have the, uh, we have the semi autonomous flying modes or uh, the manual flying modes, you know, where the user is taking control themselves. So uh, for the autonomous modes like the auto or guided mode, we already know where the flight is heading to, right? We already know the general direction where uh, the vehicle wants to go to. So we can plan a path, we can you know, avoid uh, obstacles, we can uh, plan around the obstacles, we can do all, all that kind of stuff. But with manual modes, we really don't know where the user wants the vehicle to go. You know, you can, you're going straight uh, one minute and the next second you turn right and you can do whatever you want. So there's no, uh, uh, just, just, to, just to mention that there is no way you can plan ahead. Uh, so so there, are, there are two different uh, you know, algorithms that we use to deal with this. Uh, so the first part of the presentation is going to be explaining you uh, what simple avoidance is, which is basically done in manual modes. 
and uh, the next part would be on uh, you know uh, bendy ruler and dijkstra which is done in uh, autonomous modes which is which are basically part of a path planning suite suit um uh, the uh, if you if you see under the manual mode uh, uh section uh, just a second yeah if you see under the uh, manual mode section I have two two different algorithms which is one is simple avoidance and one is ping pong method i don't think it's named ping pong method but that's just how we refer to it i think randy named it uh, named named it this and uh, so sim simple avoidance basically works uh, by uh, reducing velocity in the direction of an obstacle so if the if the if the vehicle is approaching an obstacle uh, and uh, we you know we have calculated that is definitely going to break the margin around an obstacle that the user has set uh, then it just reduces the velocity whereas the ping pong method or uh, you know which which does not really require gps uh, uh, it, it's done mostly in altitude hold modes uh, that one actually works on angles so if we are pitched 15 degrees forward and we are approaching an obstacle uh it reduces that pitch to say 10 degrees or minus 5 minus 10 degrees so that we know we go away from it so uh the proximity library right uh so many people actually uh you know especially in the discussion forums and while talking about avoidance uh, with me they they, they kind of confuse it with the range finder library the range finder library is not the same as the proximity library uh the range finder library is used by plane it is used by copter it is used by rover but the proximity library is only used by copter and rover uh the range finder library basically takes care of you know those uh those 1d lidars that uh only provide point distances to just one orientation there as proximity library actually handles uh lidars like you see on the bottom right corner uh the the, the rotating rp lidar uh where you know you have uh, 2d uh, 2d data that is that is being fed directly into audio pilot and these these data can be you know 10 20000 separate data points a minute and the proximity library actually you know does all this calculation to uh, help us store that data right so uh the the 10 you know 10000 20000 different points that are possibly entering into audio pilot we can't store i mean we'd love to store all those points but uh, it's not physically possible right to for, for us to store that and for us to process it uh so what we do what the proximity library does is it uh makes a boundary it makes a filter or you you can call it a filter that uh reduces those points so that you know we have a easier time in storing and uh, you know processing it so uh this is what the uh, proximity library does uh you can imagine you know imagine yourself to be the quadcopter right here and uh, imagine yourself in a flexible hula hoop you know holding a flexible hula hoop so uh that's that this is what we call the mini fence and this mini fence is you know eight sided so uh, we could have 100 different obstacles approaching so so each face each 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 of the side is called a sector so we could have uh, 100 different you know obstacles on each sector so 100 obstacles here 100 obstacles here you know 1000 obstacles everywhere all along these faces but we only pick out the uh, whatever is at the least distance so you know whichever is the closest in uh, in this uh, in this region so maybe we have you know a uh, obstacle here which is 5 meters away an obstacle here which is 10 meters away but we only pick out the 5 meter one because it is at the closest in this sector so basically the 10 20 different different uh, 10 10 20000 different points that i was talking about earlier uh, they are reduced to eight points uh, around the uh, around the vehicle and so when there are no obstacles available you know the if the copter is just flying happily and there is no there is no nothing in its path this is how the fence looks this is a, it is it is at its default state uh but as soon as you know say there is an obstacle that approaches from g side what we do is we bend that hula hoop or bend that fence and uh we we make it like this so you see the obstacle you see you know the, the, what the situation is but what the vehicle sees is this right here and this is what you know the simple avoidance acts towards so it, it, so if you were the vehicle you know in the middle uh, you're going to look back and see okay everything's fine at b c and d but if you look forward you see oh no g is approaching too fast you know we must do something about it so this is how it was done in uh, 2020 uh right so uh as as is visible this is this is very much a 2d algorithm uh 
right? Uh, so for example, you know, I, I told you, we have, a, we have a object here at five meters, we have obstacle here at 10 meters, but what happens if obstacle is approaching from the top or the bottom? You know, if it's approaching at uh, 10 degrees pitch, uh, how, how do you handle that? Uh, what if, you know, there, there are three obstacles, each at different pitches, but at the same sector, you know, what, ha what happens then? So this was not really a problem until very, very recent times because uh, most of the sensors like the RP LiDAR that we use, um, they only gave us 2D data, right? They, they didn't really uh, uh, have, we didn't really have the access of 3D, uh, 3D points. So why, why bother with all that, you know, uh, excess code and the code that is never going to be used. But now in 2021, we have this fantastic new um, cameras and the fantastic sensors that have the ability to give us 3D data. So, uh, you know, just to speak a little bit about the stereo depth cameras, that this is, this is a D4, Intel RealSense D455 right here uh, on, on the right. And uh, uh, so th these, these incredible devices, they are cheap. They are, I mean, relatively cheap. They are uh, small, lightweight, and uh, they have the power to give immense amount of data in, uh, in one go. So I'll show you, you know, the, the sort of data that this thing gives. And just to give you a, a little idea of, you know, how these sensors work, because we have been working uh, quite some time on them. Uh, so it, 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 it very much works like a human eyes. So this is like your left eye and this is like your right eye. Uh, and uh, the, the very oversimplified way of, the, of working is that the left eye and the right eye, both of them see the same point, but of course they're slightly shifted, right? So if you close your left eye, if you close your right eye, they, the, the vision is going to be slightly shifted. So it uses this baseline, this distance between these two sensors, and um, it uses that shift in, uh, in the image to calculate uh, you know, the depth of the obstacle. Uh, it's a very oversimplified uh, explanation, but we can have a you know we can have a chat after the conference if uh, if more people are interested in knowing how these sensors work. Uh, apart from that, these uh, the, we also have an incredible uh, RGB camera in the center. So uh, what we can do is that you know you can run all those ML AI algorithms that classify obstacles, and then you can use so you can figure out you know uh, in in camera coordinates you can figure out u comma v, which is uh, you know, what are the coordinates of say a human or a toddler walking across? And then you can figure out what the X, Y, Z, the actual physical coordinates of that uh, body frame coordinate of that obstacle is. Uh, so that's why these cameras are fantastic. And uh, these are being, you know, made, th th these are being made better every day. So uh, up, up until last year, we only had the D435 uh, I, which was the best camera that Intel RealSense had. And those gave us, you know, 10 meter range, but now we have the D455, which gives us uh, 25, 20 meters range easily. So these are being, you know, developed every day and uh, it's just exciting to see where, the, where these are heading. Uh, so back when I got these cameras, I did not, uh, you know, have any source on, uh, you know, how good these cameras are or how, how, how do they work? So I created this uh, YouTube video, which has actually become quite famous online now, because a lot of people are, uh, you know, seeing um, how the, how the camera functions and you know what is the comparison between the D four three five and the D four five five. So uh, this is what the, you get from the cameras. On the bottom, you see there's the RGB normal camera, like a, uh, like a FPV view, and on the top we have the depth visualization. Uh, so this visual, the way this visualization works, this is an incredible amount of data, right? So uh, the, de the way this visualization works is that, you know, the red, the areas in red, they are the closest to the camera, whereas the areas in blue, they are the most further away. So you see those trees in the background that you can see in the RGB camera, they are visible with, you know, the blue background and the ground, which is very, very close by, uh, that is in red. And um, I have divide, what I've done is that I've divided this entire view into a three by three cross section. And uh, I have printed down, you know, the minimum, what is the minimum distance of, uh, what, what, of what I can find in this grid. So, so for example, land is, you know, 1.65 meters away. Uh, whereas those tree in the background are uh, 14, 15 meters away as can be seen on the top. So the, so the, so the rest of the uh, videos, they're, they're gonna have similar representation. And now you know what, 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 those, what these, uh, you know, what these values, the red values are and what this grid is. Um, so, yeah. 
you know, just just a just a static test of how well these cameras function. And uh, you know, this connected to my laptop, so we are getting about 30, 40 frames a second. It goes as high as 60 or 75, depending on you know what what uh, API you use. If you use C plus it's much faster. If you use their Python API, it's much slower. Uh, but uh, uh, the point being that uh, it's just it's just incredible about how much data that we are able to gather from these sensors. Uh, right. So uh, this brings us to the question, you know, now as you saw, you know, this this hula hoop kind of thing that we do, this mini fence thing that we that we did in 2020. Uh, this is no longer sufficient, right? We need something that uh, if if a user tells you. You know, there's an obstacle at two meters up, three meters to the right, and you know, five meters away. You you need a way to process that data, and uh, uh, it was not possible up until up until now. So uh, the recent work that uh, uh, me and Peter Barker and Randy all together have done is that uh, we have converted this mini uh, mini fence to a spherish shape like this. So, um, you know, I, I, if, you, if you can recall, I told you that uh, uh, the, the, if we have like five obstacles, you know, one is here, the other one is a little further away, uh, we pick out the closest distance. The same, the same uh, idea has been extended to 3D. So if, you know, if, if, so this is one, we call this faces. So the, before we used to call it sector because it was like a 2D kind of thing, but now we call it a face because it's, 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 more, it, it's more 3D. So uh, this 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 face right here. So we could have you know hundred distances along this face, and we'll just pick out whichever is the closest uh, distance uh, in each face. So um, uh, back uh, we had so so we have uh, five layers of these faces, you know, from top to bottom. So there's one in the middle, there's one in the bottom, there's one between middle and bottom. So there there are five different faces that we have. So before we only had the ability to store, you know, eight obstacles uh, at the end of the day, but now that has been transformed into 40 obstacles, which is all around the, uh, uh, which is all around the vehicle, right? It is 3D. And uh, just to give you a visualization of how this works. So this is a tiny tool uh, that I have built to, you know, not a lot of people understand the visual visualization of these mini fences that we make. And uh, this is a tool that is still sit sitting uh, in a local branch and I intend to uh, push it up to master so that other people can also test it. I have not really found a, cool, a good way to do it yet because uh, this was a really hacky way that I figured out. Uh, so, so on the left screen, you'll see the, the normal Siddle view and uh, the, green, the green fence is actually an obstacle. It is treated as a proximity obstacle. So this is uh, at the default state, right? There's no obstacle detected and this is how the fence is. Uh, but you realize as soon as I, you know, give the command of, uh, you know, go forward, uh, uh, you know, I push the sticks forward on loiter, you'll see that the fence starts coming in together. And that is basically how, uh, so before, you know, in 2020, we only had this middle sector, this middle layer right here, the, the, the middle one. But now we have these five fantastic layer that helps us, you know, get 3D. And, uh, you know, they're, they're going in together. And that's because at this stage, you'll see the uh, the vehicle is actually quite quite near to the obstacle, and so th this is this is the view that the humans see, right? This map right here. But this is what the vehicle sees. This is what the proximity libraries see. This is what the avoidance libraries see. And um, uh, if you know, I, I was to rotate since this is body frame. If I was to rotate this uh, rotate, rotate the vehicle, uh, the the points switch like the the different points come together, but the circles themselves don't 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 rotate because this is very much body frame. This is not earth frame. And um, you know, if I was to bring back the vehicle to its uh, original position, uh, then you'd see that the fence points again. This is again what you know the. Uh, avoidance libraries is seen. And this is happening, this visualization is happening in RDPile. I mean, the, the graph is being built in a Python script outside, but all of this is being built inside uh, the proximity library. So uh, this is the most significant change that we have uh, brought to brought about in uh, you know 2021 uh, in the proximity libraries. And this has been merged to master and I'm really excited for Copter 4.1, Rover 4.1 release that are going to be able to use this. Uh, apart from that, there is now a filter on each of the face. So what happens was, uh, so we had a bunch of you know users complaining. Uh, for example, SF40C, uh, 90, 90, 95 percent of the times the data was fine, but 
what happened was that you know there was this, this one awful second where uh, the 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 distance would jump from 10 meters to uh, like 0.5 meters and that's a nightmare for avoidance right because if it's seeing an obstacle at 10 meters and all of a sudden you, the, the 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 sensor reports a uh, obstacle at 0.5 meters it's going to react to it right and we had no sen we had no filters available so uh, what I did was I added a low pass filter, which adds a you know, basic degree of uh, smoothness as well to the data. And uh, the cutoff filter to that, uh, the, the, the cutoff frequency to that filter is very much customizable by a user setable parameter. So uh, I'm also, you know, I'm hoping that any noise that user, user people were attaching, you know, random range finders from different companies and seeing their uh, raw noisy data. And uh, it, this, this is just a good way of uh, you know making sure that connect whatever sensor you have to audio pilot but you know we we've got the noise covered uh, you don't need to worry about the copter going crazy mid mid flight you know just because a sunlight came uh, for a split second inside the sensor's view and um, another uh, sort of nightmare that we face with avoidance is uh, ground detection so uh, Copter doesn't know where you know if if the ground is uh, an obstacle or uh, you know if it's if it's just ground and you know you need to ignore it. There is no way of knowing. And so what happens is that when you're taking off, uh, it sees the ground below the the lidar. Uh, they see the ground below or the grass as an obstacle and it immediately reacts to it, uh, which is scary because you're so low that any reaction could lead to a crash. Um, so we have I, so we have implemented this very elementary uh, ground detection inside proximity library. Uh, which uses the downward facing rangefinder and um, it tries to filter out any uh, any uh, uh, you know the 3d point that is uh, on the ground so for example you know the the, the downward facing rangefinder is reporting two meters altitude and um, uh, you know we, we feed in an obstacle which is which is also you know two meters below so we immediately know you know this this is a, this is a point that we need to filter out this is the ground just ignore it and this again is, uh, you know, we can disable it if we want to. You don't. Users are not forced to use this, but if you know, if you're someone who is having troubles with ground, make sure that you try this new feature in uh, Copter 4.1. It is, of course, not a feature in Rover because, um, I mean, it doesn't make sense there. Uh, right. So, uh, what's missing? You know, we've done a lot of work in um, in the in the proximity drivers, like a lot of it, but uh, there's still some stuff missing. So uh, the first one being that we've not really received a lot of uh, you know support queries on, but I'm sure you know someday they'll come when when avoidance is a little bit more uh, uh, being used. Uh, so we only support uh, one type of proximity sensor uh, at a time. So you can't connect say two lightwear SF uh, uh, you know 40 Cs or 45 Bs, or you you can use eight range finders, but that's a different thing. You can connect eight range finders at the same time, and proximity libraries will uh, you know they, they will um, uh, support that. But as far as you know proximity drivers pro proximity sensors go, you can only use the, those eight range finders, and you can't connect a SF 40 C with it. So that's one limitation of the proximity libraries. Now the other thing is that the range finders. If you see, if you go see the range finder orientation parameters, it is uh, it is defined to uh, it, it it is limited to eight orientations. You know, your forty five, your ninety, your one eighty. It is it is only limited to those orientations, and um, as well as you know, upward and downward facing uh, range finders. But now since we have a three D boundary, like like the like what I showed you just a minute back. Uh, we can actually extend the rangefinder orientations to be much more, and I don't think this is a you know big deal. I I, I mostly most likely you know already have a, 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 a basic working PR, but you know with a little bit more testing, I, I, I'm sure that you know we can get this uh, get this done. Uh, apart from that, uh, we don't have uh, we don't really have good uh, testing abilities with the uh, you know proximity uh, library. So this, for example, I was forced to make this uh, make this visualization, but uh, it, it took quite some time to make this visualization actually. So it'd be great, and Sittle being two D in itself, uh, it's kind of tough to have three D testing abilities purely Sittle wise. Uh, and you know what? How do we get around this, and how do we use other three D simulators? That is towards the end of the talk. Uh, but uh, yeah, so better setting, subtle testing abilities obviously is, uh, and auto test is something that is missing. And uh, another problem is this boundary is not closed. So uh, this this boundary right here, the, the this boundary that you see, 
uh, it has five layers, but it does not have a, you know, a, a pitch 90 and a pitch minus 90 uh, layer. So it is very much open from the top and bottom. So uh, if right now, if you were to try to feed a obstacle that is, you know, uh, pointing upwards, uh, it is going to um, it is going to put it on this layer, the topmost layer. It is not going to have this. Uh, it's not going to have a point directly upwards, uh, which is also something that um, I have been intending to work on, but you know haven't found the time yet. Uh, so, any questions regarding uh, proximity library? All right. So, uh, moving on. Uh, to simple avoidance, right? So the proximity library is like a stepping stone for simple avoidance, right? And simple avoidance is the type of avoidance that we use in, uh, uh, you know, manually controlled flight mode like loiter. Uh, so not a lot of people know how, a lot of people have used simple avoidance, but not a lot of people know how simple avoidance works. So uh, they, they have, we have two modes inside simple avoidance. One is the, uh, one is the slide mode and one is the break mode. Uh, the brake mode basically just stops in front of the vehicle, which is which is not really you know that complicated. But sorry, it just stops in front of the obstacle, which is uh, not that complicated. But the slide mode, what it tries to do is it tries to uh, slide around an obstacle, and uh, the way that it, that it works is quite simple actually. Uh, so we have a velocity vector, right? Uh, this is the velocity that is being fed by the loiter controller, and uh, we try and detect. We have these obstacles coming in from the proximity library. And uh, we try and detect, you know, uh, it, how much of how, what component of this velocity vector uh, is towards this obstacle. You know, that this is this is the, we basically project this vector onto this obstacle vector, uh, and this is the drone right here. Uh, and uh, then, if we, if we find out that you know that it is getting quite close to this obstacle right here, uh, we try to shorten this vector towards the obstacle. So the projection of this vector towards this obstacle, we try to shorten it. And uh, then we add it back into the velocity vector and the result is something like this, right? So if you were going straight ahead, instead of going straight ahead now, you're going to, you're, you're going to have the tendency to slightly bend to the left or the right. Uh, the very obvious problem with this method is uh, that uh, number one, uh, if you are directly, you know, if you're perpend perpendicular to the obstacle, the projection is also going to be in the same line. So you just end up shortening your velocity vector and not actually, uh, you know, changing directions. So uh, if if you're you know going straight to a wall, you're not going to go left or right. You're just going to stop right in the middle. But if that wall is you know slightly tilted, or if you if the if the vehicle's direction is slightly you know uh, oblique towards the wall, then we're going to have a smooth uh, sliding uh, feature that, uh, that that we support. Uh, and the biggest problem uh, that uh, uh, that uh, we had in simple avoidance till 2020 was that it sure it can you know stop in front of the vehicle it, it can stop in front of the obstacle it can slide around the obstacle but if the obstacle was to come closer to the to the vehicle uh, the vehicle will not go back so th we didn't have an active avoidance feature per se we just had you know um, a, a detect and stop feature but now in 2021 we can actually maintain a uh, set distance from uh, the obstacles. So uh, this is uh, th th this is a th this was a feature that I de developed back in my GSOC times. It was one of the highlight. It was one of the highlights of my work. And uh, uh, what we do is that uh, you know we could have obstacles. It's, it's not as easy as it seems because we can have obstacles from all directions. So we can have obstacles from the front. We can have obstacles from the back. And uh, you know we might we if we are backing up we have to make sure that we don't back into an obstacle. So uh, this has uh, I won't get into details of it, but this has a slightly uh, you know it just it just calculates a vector which is free from all the obstacles uh, and you know uh, it bang in the opposite direction of all the obstacles. And uh, so this was a very interesting simulation scenario that I uh, developed using Morse. So Morse simulator is a is an excellent platform to test uh, avoidance related stuff because uh, we have a good support for it. And um, unfortunately, Morse has been, is now dead and it's not being developed by, uh, you know, it's not being actively developed, but um, it, just using the last Morse version is fantastic. So you, you'll see in a minute. So uh, I call this, I call this simulation, the choke room. And uh, I, I love it because we have balls from all sites that are diverging into the uh, copter. 
and uh, you'll see just in a minute that so this is in loiter mode right with simple avoidance and walls are approaching from all directions and uh, you'll see how we back away and uh, so so this this is the new feature that we are releasing in copter 4.1 and uh, if if you know if a user was to do this in copter 4.0 it's just going to collide into the walls it's going to stop right in front of it but then when the walls come closer it's going to collide uh, similarly you know uh, uh, just approach it from any direction, anywhere, and your copter is safe. Uh, it's going to try and maintain, you know, as as much uh, of a margin as possible. So uh, that that's about you know backing away and the the biggest feature of simple avoidance probably that we have. Uh, apart from that, uh, simple avoidance is now smoother and safer. So. Uh, you know, uh, when I started experimenting with avoidance, um, and uh, a lot of people on the discussion forums as well, actually, uh, they 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 used to report that the vehicle is very aggressive, the vehicle is twitchy, and uh, which is not a good thing, right? Because if you're trusting your vehicle to not collide into something, especially you know beyond visual range uh, flights or FPV flights, um, uh, you don't want vehicle to be twitching when you're uh, avoiding obstacles. That's just that's just uh, eyesore. And uh, so I investigated the reason of why this was happening. And uh, this, this graph actually pretty much explains the reason uh, of, of those switches. So uh, we have the input velocity, and then uh, which is coming from loiter. And we have an output velocity, which is coming from the avoidance libraries. And uh, what happens is that uh, the difference between the input and the output velocity, which is basically the acceleration demanded by the avoidance libraries, it, it, it reached you know, uh, hundreds of uh, millisecond second, which uh, uh, we, we meters second second, which was just crazy, right? I mean, uh, vehicle can't uh, accelerate that much. And uh, so what I did was we, we have this new feature called, uh, we have this new parameter, which can actually uh, limit this acceleration to so so this is right now limited to two meters uh, per second squared, and uh, you know this is this is what the avoidance code actually demanded at first. So uh, just to just to you know give a demonstration of uh, what happens, what used to happen, and what happens now uh, with this new bit feature. If the vehicle was traveling fast, you know we have, we, it used to react this this aggressively, and you'll see that it starts you know so th this is the uh, this, this is an obstacle right here, which is, uh, it, this will never happen in real flight. I hope that, you know, there's an obstacle 10 centimeters away from the vehicle, but, but you'll see that the vehicle is just you know, swinging around and it's not, it's not a controlled, uh, backing away. It's just, it's just going crazy as you can see. Um, and that, that no one's going to be, you know, trusting their vehicle with avoidance if, if this is what it's doing. Right. So, uh, to fix this. Uh, you know, as, as, I, as I said before, we have this uh, acceleration limitation code. And uh, yeah, so just just have a look at uh, what it does now. So uh, it's flying, you know, quite fast and my, my hand comes and there it is. And you'll see the velocity being, you know, gradually decreased, decreased in, instead of, uh, you know, having a sharp decline in it. And the acceleration is very much limited. And uh, you know, just just once more, if you see the vehicle going straight forward, and my hand comes in between, it stops gradually and it goes back. So uh, yeah, this this makes the flight much much smoother. And uh, if you if you see on the top uh, on the top corner, this was the expected acceleration, and the expected ac acceleration. This is the kind of stuff that you know we were demanding out of uh, you know the vehicle, uh, five hundred thousand. I mean, that's that's just crazy. We can't do that. So all of this is now being limited, and uh, the result can be seen. Uh, right, and one of the other biggest uh, you know changes to simple avoidance is that it is uh, now three D because we have three D data that is coming from uh, proximity sensors. So and we have the ability to store three D data. So of course you you want to see a lot of this now three D because uh, that's pretty much what I've been doing since the past year, converting everything to three D. Um, so, uh, yeah, this, so this particular test is with a D455, which is a depth, which is stereo depth camera that I introduced a few slides back. And, uh, you know, this is a test, uh, of it flying. And I also want to take a moment here to, you know, thank, uh, the, the my main sponsors for this work, which was Harris Aerial. 
uh, they provide all the funds and you know all the equipment, all the funds that are needed for the equipment. So it's been it, it would not have been possible without them. So uh, thanks to Harris Ariel. Uh, <clears throat> right. So uh, just to explain you what 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 is going on here, we have this FPV view of the camera. This, so this is this is a tripod on the on the left uh, with with a you know surface mounted camera. On uh, on the right, you see a FPV view. On the on uh, on top of that FP, RGB FPV view is a filtered depth camera view. So so this is filtered. Okay, this is not the raw uh, depth that is coming from the camera. The raw depth visualization that is coming from the camera is on the left, on the top, on the, in the top left. So again, crazy on you know how much uh, data we are processing and how much data we have. Uh, Right, so uh, you'll see the vehicle approaches me and uh, just have a look. So as soon as I you know, st start approaching the vehicle, it, it moves back. And so that's the, that's the minimum it can do. But uh, just, just it, what's more interesting to see is that if I approach it from below, then it's going to actually climb up. So uh, it, it's very, very slight now, but you can see that the vehicle is actually climbing up instead of going back because that's where th this was a user commanded movement, by the way. And uh, yeah, just in a moment, you will see that the vehicle will actually attempt to climb up instead of going back. And th this is also a recent change that we have done. Yeah. So uh, as you can see, it's pretty smooth, and you know, with all this data, it's 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 a much safer flight now, and uh, it's all it's all working great. So uh, right. Uh, so that was just with one camera, right? And that was just uh, with that limited amount of data that we are receiving from one camera. But now, uh, with all the work that has been put into by Peter Barker, by myself, and by Randy. Um, we can actually have multiple depth cameras that are attached to the vehicle and to have like a almost 360 degree uh, view of the vehicle. And uh, again, uh, you know, all this work was uh, sponsored by Harris Aerial and Q Pilot. Q Pilot uh, actually, uh, you know, donated me the, the, the vehicle re required for, you know, because all these cameras are heavy, all the companion computers are heavy and I needed a much bigger vehicle. So QPilot was uh, happy in providing me that vehicle and uh, all this would not have been possible without them. So uh, thanks to QPilot. Uh, right, so this is the setup that I've used for this interesting use case. Uh, so we have two cameras. If you notice, there is one camera uh, at the front. This is the D455. And there's one camera at the back, which is the D435i. And uh, we have the, 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 the Jetson, uh, Jetson Nano. So uh, earlier, uh, the earlier versions that you had saw that they were, they were using the Intel upsquared, but since then I have, you know, uh, you started using Jetson Nano. Uh, and this is a Hexoon TD 650 frame. And uh, so, so it's a really interesting thing, uh, interesting setup that I have here. And so, uh, you know, the, just a wide, very, very wide view of, uh, uh, you know, what all is here. And uh, so, so this is the front camera, the D four five five, and this is obstacle number one, the the garden umbrella there. Obstacle number two is me right here, you know, holding the stick. And uh, on the back there is a D four three five I, and uh, you know that's that's just uh, that's detecting obstacle number two. And uh, so you know, just see the massive amount of data that you know we are processing and uh, that is being fed into the vehicle. And uh, so. Uh, the, the 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 frames per second on this uh, uh, that I was getting out of the two cameras was a little below ten frames per second because the Jetson Nano can't really keep up with it's not it's not good with multi camera support. Uh, if you had just one camera, you know you'll get 15, 16 frames per second, but which is which is sufficient. But with two cameras, it was lagging. I think you know if I upgrade to a better uh, Jetson computer, like a more expensive one, uh, like the TX2 perhaps, then uh, it's going to be slightly better. But for a demonstration, this works. So uh, uh, you'll see in a moment that you know I approach the vehicle from behind, and the copter reacts to it, right? And it stops right in front of the front of the obstacle, the other obstacle. 
And so no matter what I do, it's not going to, uh, it's not going to collide into it. It's going to go left, right, but it's not going to collide into it. So I'll just let the video play and, you know, just uh, tell you what exactly is happening. You know, you can go up, you can go down, which was earlier not possible with 2D LIDARs, right? But it's not going to, yeah. So uh, obstacles on both sides, but now you're going to see that it's going to attempt to go to left instead of, you know, going straight. So uh, yeah, that is uh, just, that is just amazing uh, ability, right? That uh, the vehicle will refuse to collide into any obstacle, no matter what you do. And the avoidance, another thing to notice is that avoidance is mostly uh, smooth. It's not twitching around. It's not, uh, you know, reacting aggressively either. So on, on most parts, it should, it should you know, uh, help the users uh, avoid obstacles and not really be a gimmicky feature. Uh, another just a uh, cool, cool demo uh, in, in the same video is, uh, just a second. Right, so uh, right now you'll see that, you know, just this one camera set up on the left and the copter flying. So I'm pushing on the sticks. If you see, I'm pushing, I'm pushing as far possible as I can. Uh, and this is loiter mode. And the vehicle is just still there. It's just, it's just standing steady. It's not doing anything. And uh, which, is, which is amazing, right? It, you can go left, you can go right, but it will not let you go forward. And you can approach it from any direction up or down, as long as it's in the, it's in the you know, camera's frame, it's not going to let you, let you collide into it. So uh, that's just, I mean, uh, it's just self-explanatory how, uh, how this can be used, right? So uh, that was, you know, that was it about simple avoidance and how much uh, we have upgraded it in this year. And uh, uh, we have a couple of, you know, tiny features as well that I've not mentioned, but uh, uh, so we, we have this huge issue of, you know, detecting ground as obstacle. And I already told you that in proximity uh, avoidance, sorry, in, uh, in the proximity library section, but, uh, uh, so, so to so to counter that that problem, we also have this new uh, new parameter which you can set up, which basically says that you know, uh, do you want a minimum altitude before uh, avoidance is switched on? And um, if you know if you're below that altitude, then avoidance is automatically turned off, and uh, so 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 you don't react to uh, the ground. Uh, and uh, another you know thing that is to do is to make slide more slidey. To you know, it's it's it it does slide, but we want to make it uh, a little bit more than that. You know, the slide should be more obvious, and uh, obviously, you know, we, we can't we, we can't say that it is hundred percent reliable or hundred percent smooth. Um, th those those improvements will keep on going forward as 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 time progresses. Um, a real cool video of you know, so I, I'm working a lot on ground detection. Uh, so a, a really cool video of you know how we can do it uh, outside of our pilot, how we can do it you know at the uh, at the companion computer level uh, is uh, so yeah so again you know this depth visualization and uh, this uh, this RGB camera view but this time if you see uh, on the depth and the depth uh, view we have these tiny circles and these tiny circles is actually land it's it's the land that is detected so um, uh, if you uh, if you see when the when the video unfreezes yeah. So it's, it's tracking the land pretty well, right? And I'm, I'm flying quite low, but if you notice there are no red, uh, so there are this red uh, distances here, as I told you before, but there are no red distances here because it is not detecting any valid distances. And that is because we have land here. So uh, yeah, so you can do all sorts of crazy. And this algorithm, by the way, it's a very simple algorithm called Ransack, many of you might know. Uh, I can, you know, I, if, I, if I start explaining the algorithm, uh, we'll go over time. So I'll skip the uh, algorithm description. Uh, but yeah, so, so you see how low the vehicle is flying right now. It's barely a meter above the ground, but the, but the land is being detected and, you know, it's not reporting any, any obstacle. So that, that's, that's just a great thing to have. And this feature is, does not exist yet in, uh, in, you know, in the, in the scripts that we provide, but I'm hopeful that, you know, in the very near future, I'm able to have this, uh, feature as well. And uh, so when an obstacle does come in between and, you know, there is land, so that's, the, that's me, that's the obstacle, you'll see that 
you know the obstacle is being detected and the black dots move away so uh, th th that's also you know a good handy feature to have and uh, this makes it like super reliable so you have ground detection filters here you have ground detection detection filters in proximity library you have ground detection filters in avoidance and you know all three of them together you can be almost sure that you know ground is not going to play any any role in uh, low altitude flying so uh, yeah that was it about uh, you know simple avoidance and uh, you know manual mode avoidance the rest of the presentation is going to be about uh, uh, obstacle uh, of uh, you know of path planning and autonomous uh, in auto in autonomous mode so uh, any any questions so far right uh, so so i'm i'm audible right my my mic is working fine yes it's just <laughs> yeah no it, it's quite incredible i mean it's I, the I, for the question but so much as an observation i remember uh, peter brought a vehicle running your code out to spring valley for us to try it it was just to experience it directly was quite incredible to watch right. it doing that avoidance it was it was really quite stunning uh how well it works and uh, it's the sort of thing where i would love the conference to be in person and we actually have people experiencing just how well this stuff works but uh yeah very, very impressive, but I uh, should let you get on with the, the next section. Right, right. Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm gonna go quickly because we're, we're running out of time. So, uh, uh, and yeah, just, just we, one we last a few thing. minutes over, don't, don't need to rush. Yeah, uh, thank you. So uh, just, just one, more, one more thing before I wrap up this section. Uh, we are also actively, you know, working towards, and you know, Peter Parker does more work in this, but uh, on making really easy AP Sync images out of this. So all you have to do is, you know, just connect everything and you're ready to go. So uh, we are constantly working towards that, but this new development features, you know, they take a little bit time to reach that section. So if you are a developer and you're interested in this and you can ping me anytime, I'll send you my scripts, you can try it out and uh, that'd be great. So uh, next, moving on to uh, the, uh, the, the, the uh, autonomous modes. So uh, we have something called as the obstacle database. And uh, this is needed for storing uh, storing obstacles. So what this does is that it stores obstacle inside uh, you know RD pilot inside the uh, flight controller's memory, and uh, that data is being uh, constantly refreshed. And these these obstacles they are stored as earth frame vectors instead of obstacle uh, instead of uh, uh, body frame vectors. And uh, the the reason is obviously that you know we want to have some sort of memory. Uh, with respect to obstacles. So for example, you know, if you have a 1D rangefinder and, uh, you know, uh, it's yawing towards the right and it sees obstacles behind it, uh, you know, just because you have, you know, yawed a little bit does not mean that uh, the obstacle is not there. So uh, you, 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 you want to have some sort of memory, right? So that's what the obstacle uh, database does. And uh, so it's it's a really I like the, I love the implementation of how it, this was not implemented by me it was implemented by someone else but uh, it's it's really good how it works and uh, <clears throat> uh, so uh, the the recent uh, updates that you know we have brought about to obstacle database is that it is also 3D now so you know it it, it used to only store uh, x y uh, but as as like a vector from uh, the origin but now it stores x y z. Uh, which is really great, right? And uh, uh, we also have the ability to reject obstacles around home. And this was also, you know, just a very simple feature to uh, remove the ground that was being detected, right? The, again, again, just adding on to that. So while we are taking off and landing, uh, which is mostly around home, uh, you can reject obstacles in the obstacle database. Uh, and you can choose to use this. You can, you know, disable it with a parameter up to you. So, uh, Bendy ruler. So the obstacle databases, the, the obstacle database directly feeds uh, into Bendy ruler, and Bendy ruler uses that uh, th th those those proximity uh, data and uh, you know for, for planning its path. So uh, Bendy ruler was actually uh, you know uh, algorithm that was uh, that was the original work of you know Canberra UAV and Tridge and uh, you know, other people worked worked on it. Uh, it was it, it was first implemented for uh, plane. It was not at all for rover and copter, but now it is only being used with copter and rover. And I think uh, there are plans to, you know, have a Lua script for plane, but that has not yet been implemented. 
And so it, it is. It is. It is a relatively simple, uh, you know, Ray-based algorithm. And uh, you can. So Randy also explained this. Uh, you know, explain how this works in his, in 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 last year's conference. So you can have a look at that as well. But just to give you a little background, uh, what it does is it it does it, it does it does uh, avoidance in two steps. Step number one is that it you know it sees there is an obstacle in front. And so this this red marker right here, this is the obstacle in front. Um, it you know it projects distance a little bit forward, and it sees oh no you know this is this is quite close to the obstacle we can't go in this direction. So it turns a little bit to the left you know five degrees to the left, and it sees okay no we still don't have proper distance to you know we don't have a set margin from the obstacle. So and and then we turn right, and so the, the, so it just does this you know ping pong left right maneuvers left right uh, not maneuvers but uh, uh, left right pro location projections. Uh, till it figures out a position, which is you know this this green line here, uh, that is free from the obstacle, and uh, at this point you know we could we could stop this algorithm here and we could just go forward. But uh, what this algorithm does is it does a step two, which is that it does the same search, uh, but in front of it from this from this already projected point, so that you know we are sure that you know once we reach this obstacle, but once we reach this deviated point, there is no obstacle in front of it. I hope uh, you know that was clear. So uh, and this this uh, path. So we have two path planning parameters. We have uh, Bendy ruler and we have Dijkstra. This works with proximity sensors. So if 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 you know a human starts walking towards it, or if a car starts walking walking uh, running towards the the vehicle, the vehicle is going to be able to avoid it. Uh, the same is not true for Dijkstra. So just a demonstration of how uh, you know well the uh, this is working in twenty twenty one. Uh, so this is uh, uh, this is just a copter, you know, going up, uh, going going to uh, going to a zigzag sort of pattern, like uh, back and forth pattern. And I usually, you know, have a slow moving vehicle so that you know if anything goes wrong, uh, I'm able to control it. But uh, you can, it can be much faster than this. So now you'll see you know, a, a wild obstacle appears uh, out of nowhere, and uh, as soon as you know the uh, the vehicle turns around and it sees the obstacle it moves towards the left and it avoids it and this is all purely bendy ruler by the way uh, you know i'm not doing anything i have the controller in hand but it's not being used it's just so that you know if it goes too much to the left or too much to the right and it collides with the you know where the sensor can't see then we have a problem so uh, yeah and uh, you know it's just it's just great how uh, bendy ruler works so that's uh, about bendy ruler, and uh, you know you can approach it from any direction, and it's not going to, and it's just going to continue towards its path as soon as the obstacle is cleared. Right. So, moving on. Uh, so, what are the updates to bendy ruler in 2021? The updates are that obstacle detection is now 3D. But this does not imply that the algorithm is 3D. So the algorithm is very much 2D, and it only searches, uh, you know, in X Y direction. Or as I in build, it's it's not a tough thing to do, but it's just that we have not gotten to it yet. And so uh, with 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 this feature right here, where you know the obstacle detection is 3D. Uh, you'll realize that you know when the vehicle is uh, pitching downwards, and you know if it's if it's rolling around, uh, it might detect the ground or it might detect an obstacle which is down below. But uh, you know, back in Copter 4.0, this was detected as something which is uh, at the horizontal level. It's not. It wasn't detected as an obstacle down below. So uh, now what we do is we multiply the obstacles with a rotation matrix. You know, the 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 attitude of the uh, flight. And uh, the, so, so, so the difference that it makes is that in these rocky, in this, this is again Morse, and uh, this is uh, you know in th this is Copter 4.0 on the left, and this is Copter 4.1 on the right. And uh, you'll see is that the, the vehicle keeps you know uh, avoiding random obstacles which were actually down below and not in front of it, but the vehicle on the right is you know traveling smoothly; it has no problem at all. And uh, this is a low altitude flight; so it's like two three meters. And uh, <clears throat> just a second. So um, yeah, 
you'll see you know that this one has already reached waypoint 3 but uh, this one's struggling to even cross waypoint 2 and uh, you know you'll just realize that the copter in the end uh, because of you know such faults the, the it not being it not detecting those false obstacles reaching the final state quite early, quite earlier than the uh, you know copter 4.0 version so that's that's one update to bendy ruler uh, the other update is performance improvements. So um, the problem with Bendy Ruler was that it was too, uh, too you know, uh, uh, it, it used to be, it was too easy for it to change the directions. So, you know, if it is heading towards the left and all of a sudden it finds that, you know, the path to the right is just a tiny bit better, like, you know, just minuscule bit better, it used to immediately switch over to it. There was no restriction on, you know, the, how much, how much, uh, you know, how much path can we change, which is not a good thing, right? So uh, you'll see why it's not a good thing. So the vehicle is heading forward and, you know, both of them react identically. The one on the left is again Copter 4.0 and the one on the right is Copter 4.1. And uh, <clears throat> you'll see that the vehicle, they're both traveling, you know, everything's fine till about this point. But all of a sudden, the one on the left, it, 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 it started going towards the opposite direction. But the one on the right, it, you know, is, it sticks to that pattern and uh, it, it doesn't deviate back. So, and you'll realize that this vehicle is now stuck, you know, you can't, you could, so if you were to do this in Copter 4.0, it's just going left, right, left, right, and you won't be able to get out of it. But now you can, you know, we hopefully have more resistance in path change and uh, that leads to uh, just more robustness in this algorithm. So that's another uh, change that we have bought in, uh, you know, 2021. And uh, uh, so, so to do this, you know, we have a couple of parameters actually, and uh, I'm going to have a lot of documentation on, which is still left to do, but uh, on how to do this. Uh, we also have a new bendy ruler type. So instead of, you know, going horizontally, the, for people who prefer the vehicle to go uh, vertical, we can do that as well. So, you know, the vehicle is again, flying back and forth, back and forth. This is a tiny, I hope you can see the tiny copter that is going back and forth. And, uh, Right. So uh, as soon as, you know, uh, an, an obstacle appears, uh, uh, you'd see that the vehicle actually, you know, goes up instead of go going left and right. So uh, just in a second, you'll see that. Yeah. So it climbs up and, you know, it dodges the person and it climbs down and resumes to its original path. So if you're, you know, if you're in, say, uh, you know, uh, a farm or somewhere where, you know, there are low, there are low uh, plants below you, or, you know, just if, if you prefer climbing up, then this is the feature to go with. And uh, basic difference between this and the horizontal bendy ruler is that it just searches for free path vertically instead of horizontal. That's the only difference. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so that was it about, uh, you know, Bendy Ruler and uh, what are the updates to Bendy Ruler. Uh, now moving on to the other type of path planner, which is Dijkstra. So uh, I'm not going to, you know, explain how Dijkstra works. And I think uh, Randy did it in his last uh, conference. But uh, just, just to give you a little idea, Dijkstra is a very, uh, very, very famous, uh, you know, uh, algorithm that is taught to almost all math majors, all uh, CS computer science majors. And uh, if we have a set of nodes, uh, it, it helps us calculate the least, you know, the shortest distance path through them. It's, it's, a, it's a graph based algorithm and uh, it's, just, it's just very famous. You can read about it on Wikipedia. You can read, you have, you know, multiple YouTube videos. And so we have that as well in Audiopilot. And, uh, but this does not work with proximity sensors. And I'll tell you why uh, in, in a while. So uh, the way this works is that, you know, we have this fence, this black line is fence. And it marks these safe, it, it, it creates these nodes, these, these, these red dots, these safe nodes, and uh, it, it travel, it plans a path through them. So this is the shortest distance through the nodes. And uh, that's basically how, you know, Dijkstra works. Uh, so, uh, so uh, yeah, just a second. Uh, yeah, uh, a new addition. So, so, as, so as I said, that you know, Dijkstra's does not really have uh, uh, the ability to detect proximity-based uh, obstacles. But the, the reason is that you know, Dijkstra's take, takes a long time to process, and if, you know, if, if even if even for a small obstacle, usually the tendency is that the obstacle database it stores you know 50, 60 uh, different points inside it, 
and uh, you know, so we'll have you know 50, 60 different nodes, and then the and this keeps changing. So the Dijkstra's algorithm will have to you know rerun again and again and again, and that's just something that most computers can't keep up with. So that's the reason why you know Dijkstra's does not really uh, have a proximity sensor detection. So uh, to you know just to to still use Dij Dij Dijkstra's and uh, to have the uh, bendy ruler capabilities, we have come up with a bendy ruler and Dijkstra fusion. So we use so this is this is like, sort of like a you know ROS way to a robotic op operating system way to. Uh, you know, do this. So we have D D D Dijkstra's as a global planner, which you know, basically at the start of the uh, at the start of the uh, mission, what it does is that it plans a path. That you know, this is this is the general direction that we're going to go towards. And if we have a few obstacles in between, that is you know, bendy ruler job. We're going to switch over to bendy ruler. is going to take care of all these obstacles. And as soon as all the physical obstacles, you know, the, the proximity based obstacles are done, it's going to switch over back to Dijkstra's uh, navigation. Uh, so, so now users don't have to, uh, you know, choose. Do we want bendy ruler or do we want Dijkstra? We want Dijkstra, but you know, we can't use. We, we, it doesn't have uh, proximity-based avoidance. So now choose this, uh, which is going to be available in Copter 4.1 and Rover 4.1. And uh, just a simple, uh, uh, you know, demonstration on how it, it is much easier to demonstrate this on a simulation uh, rather than uh, uh, you know real flight video. So I have this. The vehicle is in guided mode, and the vehicle is you know, down all the way here. And I have you know asked it to go here. So the green, the green line here is the fence, right? And there, there are proximity obstacles as well. So it has decided to you know go around the fence. That's all Dijkstra. And on the on the top also you'll see you know uh, Dijkstra is being printed because that's the OA type in, that we are using right now. And uh, as soon as uh, you know the vehicle approaches the, uh, the 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 obstacle, it switches over to bendy ruler. And now it's going to, uh, you know, so so it's deviated from the path as you'll see, uh, you know, on the bottom right corner, and uh, it's just it's the only thing that is doing right now is avoiding this obstacle right here. And uh, as soon as this uh, uh, this obstacle is avoided, it's going to switch back to uh, Dijkstra. So in a second, you'll see the map right here, and um, right there, you'll see that the path is all of a sudden, you know, the Dijkstra's path is calculated. And it has switched back to Dijkstra's maneuver, and uh, you know it's just going. Now it's the shortest path again. So you're co you're covered in all ways. So this is the this is again the newest path planner feature that we have. Um, uh, and you know what's left to do. Uh, so again, you know, bendy the obstacle detection is 3D, but bendy ruler itself is not 3D. It's very much 2D. So you know, do that. Uh, we can integrate simple avoidance in um, in our autonomous modes as well. So that you know, PR exists for this. I've done it. Uh, it just needs a little bit more testing. So most likely, 4.1 is going to have this in uh, you know next couple of weeks. Uh, spline navigation, to to the to the best of my knowledge, does not work with uh, you know the path planning algorithms unless that has changed in S curves. I'm not aware of. But uh, you know, up until at least last week, uh, spline navigation. If you if you were to use spline navigation. Uh, it's just going to collide into the obstacle. So we, that's something that we need to do. Um, and yeah, the extra does not support proximity avoidance, but I explained, you know, that's, that's probably for the best. Uh, so this is the last, very last part of my, you know, last, just last couple of slides. Um, and I'm almost done. Sorry for taking more time than, you know, I was allotted with. Um, uh, so th this is just for, you know, those simulation geeks that, you know, love simulations. And uh, as I said before, you know, simulation is uh, kind of tough in this area. And, uh, back when I was a noob and, uh, you know, I did not know how all, all of this works. Um, I used to take, take, I used to, you know, just test everything on flight and I have had, you know, uh, scripts crashing down and that causing, you know, uh, the blades to uh, cut into my hand and stuff like that. So uh, several body parts have been injured in the process. I'm not lying. And I'm sure, uh, you know, it seems the case with everyone else. So uh, we have two excellent, excellent simulators that have been, that are really easy to use. Uh, you know, thanks to people like Tridge and Rajat and, you know, all the people who have worked on AirSim and, you know, Morse. Uh, these are excellent platforms uh, that, that, that you can use in combination to Sittle to test everything before you take flight. Uh, so uh, you, I, I hope you remember, you know, the, the land detection code that uh, the, the ransack algorithm that I showed to you a while back. Before I tested that, the it and flight, I actually coded the same thing on AirSim. 
So this is how it looks on AirSim, right? This is the depth view. It's the exact same. It's the D435i simulated in AirSim. And uh, this is the, you know, the RGB view. This is the depth camera view. And uh, you'll see that, you know, the land is being detected with those black arrows. And I didn't even need to change any code. I just copied it as it is from, you know, uh, from this to the real sense canvas. It was, it was that easy for me. I didn't need to change anything. So uh, you'll see how well these, uh, you know, these uh, simulators actually work and how incredible it is to use them. You know, you can have all these blocks and uh, so, you know, you can take it to crazy things like, you know, flying just half a meter above the ground and see if your algorithm is robust enough to detect obstacles there. And so as you realize that, you know, my algorithm right now is working quite nice. And as soon as you know the the obstacle approaches, it's going to detect it and uh, it's going to stop. So that's 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 a you know that's that's how incredible AirSim is. And uh, I'm going to have a lot more documentation on how to set up uh, this sort of stuff with AirSim. Uh, and uh, you know, if you are someone who wants to do multi uh, you know multi camera simulation, multi depth camera simulation with AirSim. So this this is the, the one on the left is a forward facing uh, depth camera. The one on the right is a backward facing uh, depth camera, and one on the top is a bottom facing depth camera. And uh, so you can do and just see the amount of details that you know AirSim gives us. It's it's as good as you know testing physically. And uh, so uh, it's again you know divided into those three by three grid that I was talking about earlier. And uh, just to see, you know, how how detailed the uh, simulators really are, and uh, you know when it starts approaching, you can see the trees, and you can you know you can do any any sort of you know uh, ML AI stuff that you want to do, or uh, you know any statistical analysis you want to do, you can do it right here. You don't need to take your copter out anymore. And you know um, if you want to, uh, so this is again something that I really want to work on the future. Uh, that have the camera pointed downwards and be able to detect terrain much, much before uh, the copter is on top of it, right? So right now we have a downward facing uh, range finder. And when the vehicle is on top of that terrain, that's when we actually figure out where the, uh, you know, if you have to climb or descend, but we can actually plan for it in, you know, much, much more, uh, you know, future if, uh, if you use these cameras. So, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, so as you'll see, you know, if, if I pause it right here, this is the downward facing, you know, this is how the trees look from the top. And uh, this is how the trees look from the forward. And uh, it's just crazy on how much, you know, how, how you don't even need to get out of your seat anymore and uh, how you can just use these simulators. So uh, yeah, and then there's more switch I've already showed you a few videos of with the joke room and stuff like that. So uh, that was it regarding uh, you know my presentation and uh, hopefully you guys had uh, you know had fun looking at all the experiments that I did uh, and yeah you know stay safe and fly safer and apart from that I just want to give a shout out to you know uh, all the people that I've worked with Randy uh, Peter who have been you know, really mentoring me it's just been a year it's just been a year since I've been with uh, you know involved with uh, you guys and it's been it's been uh, it's, it's just been transforming on how much I've learned so thank you. And uh, that's it from my side. Fantastic. That was absolutely brilliant, uh, Richard. Really, really enjoyable. Um, and uh, it's, it's incredible the progress that's been made over the last year on, um, on object avoidance. And it's great to see that the simulation systems being used in uh, such, a, such a marvelous way. So really gladdens my heart to see all this stuff coming together so well with such sophisticated capabilities. So are there yeah, any Trish. questions off the floor? Hey, Trish, this is Bill. Yeah, g'day, Bill. Hey, uh, Rashab, this is great work. I really, really Thank loved you. watching your presentation and, and really great uh, capabilities that uh, have been brought to the uh, to RG Pilot. But the question for you is um, what hardware do we need, I mean, so the depth cameras, it seemed like you had some sort of a companion computer or something like that doing calculations right. or, so I uh, guess describe real briefly, describe kind of with, with depth camera, what do you need? And then with like, I guess there's the um, 3D or not 3D, but basically uh, the, the range finders, I guess, which right. one of those require companion computers? Uh, right, so, um all the, uh, yeah, thanks for this question. And uh, so the re really easy answer to this is that uh, all, the, uh, all the sensors that we support directly in, in Copter, 
so those are the lightware sensors or uh, you know the the range finders those are all directly connected to the flight controller and so uh, you don't really <clears throat> need any companion computer with that you'll get this exact same you know all the exact same output uh, without in any need of companion computers you just need to set the right parameters and you're good to go it's it's that easy uh, but with these cameras with these 3d cameras uh, so it is important to know that all of the calculations actually happen inside the vehicle inside the uh, flight controller and the only uh, usage of the companion computer is to uh, connect to the cameras uh, extract the depth image and you know, just just basically uh, divide it into a three by three grid, and you know, in whatever way, and uh, pack it into a X Y Z obstacle, and send it as a mapping message. So that's 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 about that's the only use of the uh, of the uh, uh, companion board. But all the calculations, all the avoidance, you know, all the all the three D spheres stuff that I was showing you before, everything is done on board. Great, thank you. Um, anything, you know, if I can uh, answer any other questions. Yeah, um, I've got, uh, well, first up on, on behalf of all the other developers, we, we all hope you healed up quickly um, <laughs> as you were developing everything. And um, uh, how have you gone with, uh, you know, you, you look like you've got a lot of USB 3 sort of floating around there. How, um, how much trouble have you had sort of you know, dealing with interference and that sort of stuff. And, and do you, is there a way of sort of doing it without using, you know, those uh, painful things? Um, so uh, as, as, you, as you said, you know, the multi-camera support, when, when you have more than one, one camera, it's, it's really, it's, really uh, it's, a, it's a pain in the head to, uh, you know, have all those cables and all those USB 3. And these, by the way, require uh, USB 3.0 ports. Uh, so, uh, you know, as much, so I have only tested with two cameras because I only have two cameras and it's not been a, you know, issue so far, but, uh, as I read on the forums and so I've, I spent like hours scoring through forums, you know, figuring out what the, what the problems I have and if other people have it. So, uh, you know, what people tell me is that beyond, uh, at least on the Jetson Nano. So if you have a high powered laptop, like I use, uh, it's not going to be an issue. You know, you can use, you can use a USB, uh, extension hub. And you can connect as many cameras, like five, six, eight. I've seen people use eight cameras at a time, and it's not really an issue. But with a low-powered flight controller, uh, sorry, a low-powered companion board like the Jetson Nano, anything more than like two cameras, uh, you're not only going to, you know, reach the limit of how if you can, you know, uh, on the CPU limits, but you are also going to reach the bandwidth limit of the USB ports. So, uh, you know, anything more than two or two or three cameras on the Jetson Nano is not advisable at the moment. But if for high powered uh, uh, companion boards, you can go to, you can easily go to four. A lot of people have done four. But there is no, uh, there is no way we can, you know, circumvent that at the moment. You know, you, 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 you can have multiple companion boards if you want, but uh, that, that's not a solution, right? So, sorry, no solution for that. Um, is there any opportunity to um, work with uh, the the work with the cameras themselves to output just the data we need for the autopilot? Um, so I have asked Intel about this in in one of the forums, and they said that this is something that they want to do, uh, which will be really interesting. So you can have like just a tiny camera, and and a few cameras actually do this. The Intel real the, the depth cameras that I have used don't do this, but uh, that is very much a possibility in the future. You know companies are working on it, but we don't have a product yet that does this. And when that happens, we, we won't really need any companion computer, right? We just need Mavling messages being transformed, being transformed from the camera directly to the vehicle and all works well. Thanks, Matt. Great work. Thank you. Um, so uh, is there um, any, anything else? I can uh, answer. There's one from YouTube, mate, just from Scott Arrow. If the, right. if the obstacle is suddenly removed, do you get full stick input immediately or does the controller slowly add in all the stick input? Um, yeah, this is a very good question. So right now, uh, uh, right now, this is a problem with Copter that if the obstacle is removed all of a second, uh, it does have the tendency to, uh, you know, uh, 
have a give a bit of a jerky reaction so while the obstacle comes in front of it is not an issue but if the obstacle is removed it is a slight issue but uh, this is something that i'm working on and I, this is something that i noticed just past week so um, I, I, i'm i'm sure that you know in the next month or so uh, we're going to have a solution for this as well but it is a problem right now All right, fantastic. So, yeah, no, really. no further questions, uh, Randy. No, no. I'm just saying, just really, really great work, and uh, you know, just you know, working over the last you know year or or a little bit more with Rishab. What I really always appreciate is just the level of testing that he does. So, you know, there's no point in having a uh, obstacle avoidance system that you know isn't reliable. Uh, but you just put so much effort into the testing to make sure that it really works. That it's uh, yeah, Randy. It's real Randy, pleasure. I've been. Randy, I've been kind of been lucky enough to see this sort of presentation on kind of a weekly basis for quite some time, which has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, guys. And uh, uh, it would obviously not be possible with, uh, you know, without the mentors like I've uh, gotten. And, uh, you know, just, just, last, just last line that uh, <clears throat> I just hope that, you know, avoidance is not a gimmicky feature anymore. And it is something that we use uh, compulsorily in all vehicles and you know people actually start testing it and you know, start realizing that it is reliable and they can use this in their everyday uh, vehicles as a fail safe feature and not as something you know that they, they shoot a video and then they turn it off so um, I'll, I'd love to hear you know reviews of people of developer team members who you know flash 4.1 and uh, start testing them and uh, if they are we have changed so much so much like we have added so many new features that we're bound to have bugs but uh you know i'm going to be all on top of it and uh, hopefully fix it as soon as possible fantastic thank you so much all right well that um ends the evening's presentation for the the second session of the 2021 dev conference and uh thank you very much for the two presentations we had this evening so we're back tomorrow morning, um, Canberra time, uh, which is probably for many of you going to, you know, if you're in Europe, will be the middle of the night. Uh, my apologies for that. Um, so we're starting off bright and early with a Tom at, at nine o'clock in the morning, Canberra time with Tom Pittinger giving an AP Perif update, um, followed by Julio Mendoza Mendoza about IG Pilot in Latin American research. And then documentation update and the ANU visual odometry system. Then finally, the uh, the blimp support from Michelle. So really looking forward to those talks in the morning. And so um, thank you all for attending this evening. And, and thank you, everyone, who uh, joined us via the live stream on YouTube. And uh, so uh, wish you all a, a great evening and look forward to talking to you all in the morning. Good night, everyone. Catch you later. Thanks, Trish. Good night. Hey, everybody. Good night.